Kenny was a mother of two adult children. Kenny was a grandmother. Kenny worked for Kidney Health for nearly 20 years. He was confused. That reaction. Uh, he, as we were all standing out there in the Grand Lynch residence, he had shoved his hands in his front pants pockets and were shaking them, rubbing them back and forth in a very fast manner. She was, um, she was looking at me with the horse. Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, Hit the subscribe, like, and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gisela Kay. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we're going to be watching day four of this Daniel Howard trial together. As you may know, we are one day behind in the coverage, which I'm really enjoying so that I could defluff all the trial footage. For example, today's day four, the original footage was seven hours and 44 minutes and we've got it down to three hours and 51 minutes. Oh my goodness, there was a lot of fluff on this day. There was... A long lunch break, there were coffee breaks, and then there was like waiting around for witnesses to arrive, and then, you know, just waiting for the jury to be reading through some of the Facebook messages and things. It was so I'm really glad. <laughs> I'm actually really glad that we're doing this on a one day delay. And I'm thinking I want to keep doing this next week. So from Monday, we'll watch day five, okay? Um, so welcome to all my mods. Thank you so much for everything you do. Welcome to all my patrons. Uh, if you haven't yet checked out Patreon, please do. It's a great source of support and I offer lots of unique, you know, exclusive perks over there that you don't get anywhere else. Welcome to all the existing subscribers. Thank you so much for being subscribed, for being part of this community. Um, I know we cover, you know, trials and lots of other cases. We've got some updates to do in other cases as well. So make sure you are subscribed so that you, you know, see what you're interested in because we always talk about lots. Okay, so before we do that, remember yesterday, I told you that I would be showing you the documents that Grizzly Cat got for us, which is of the... Uh, the witness lists. So let me bring that up for you quickly. And the indictment, okay? Uh, so in this case, you had to actually request it and pay for it and all of that. You couldn't just get it like Coburger documents, even though this is also in Idaho, right? Okay, so here they say in the district court of the first judicial district of the state of Idaho uh, in and for the county of Kootenai. State of Idaho plaintiff versus Daniel Charles Howard. Now, if you haven't seen the other days, day one, two, and three, yeah, I would highly recommend checking it out. It's timestamp for you, and my goodness, yesterday's 911 calls, oh my word, and that body cam was so hectic. Okay, so this is the um, indictment. They said Daniel Charles Howard is accused by the grand jury of Kootenai County by this indictment of the crimes of count one, domestic battery, and count two, murder in the first degree. Okay, and they say count one, that the defendant Daniel Charles Howard on or about the 10th day of July of 2020 in Kootenai County, Idaho did, um, Idaho did in committing a battery inflict a traumatic injury or injuries upon the person of Kendi Howard to wit redness to her ear and bruising to her chest and arm and where Kendi Howard and the defendant were household members. Count two says that the defendant Daniel Charles Howard on or about the second day of February of 2021 in Kootenai County, Idaho did unlawfully, deliberately, with malice of forethought and with premeditation kill Candy Howard, a human being to it, by asphyxiating her, all of which is contrary to the form, force, and effect of the statute in such case made and provided, and against the peace and dignity of the people of the state of Idaho. There's going to be an expert today that's going to explain that carotid restraint technique, you know, the chokehold, basically, that um, they allege that this defendant put his wife in before making it look like she took her own life. Okay, so thank you so much to Grizzly Cat for this document as well. And then the, here's the witness list. I've just highlighted some of the ones um, that we've already seen. So they said they're expecting 55 to 60 witnesses. But at the end of today's footage, you'll hear that the state says that they anticipate resting their case by Wednesday. And they think the trial should wrap up by Friday. But then the defense attorney said, no, we think it'll be Monday. They think they're going to 
Rest the, the state will rest the case Wednesday. The defense will present their witnesses on Thursday and Friday and maybe a little bit of Monday, and then it'll be jury deliberation time. So it's going to be shorter than we thought. So some of the witnesses we've already seen are highlighted in purple here. I hope you can see the color, can you? And so we still expect to see a few others, a few other detectives, um, possibly also that Dr. John Howard, the original coroner, he is on this list here. So that's interesting. Uh, you could just pause to read if you want to read any of this. Some of these are going to be on today, so it would be more highlights. But uh, this is it, and if you want this document, I have posted it on uh, Patreon if you do want it there, and it is available to everyone. There are also free posts for everyone without you joining, so you could see that today. Um, okay, so here's Brooke Kendall Wilkins. That is the victim's daughter who's actually going to be on the stand today. Brian Ray Wilkins. Um, so more family members. So yeah, this is the witness list. Over here, I've just highlighted, it's, it's a second one. It was just an amended one. Here's John D. Howard. They say MD to be provided. Like, is he actually going to take the stand? Wow. And then they added these two that they highlighted. Jill Pakala and Chantel Souther. And here's the defense's witness list, the defendant's preliminary witness list. Uh, they say comes now Daniel Charles Howard by and through his attorney, Jason G. Johnson, and submits his preliminary disclosure of lay and expert witnesses. The defendant may call the following witnesses at trial, although not necessarily in the same order listed. I don't know who any of these people are. Roy Fitting, Chris McCullough, John Howard, that's that one. The original coroner who said undetermined death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one with a short timer syndrome. Yes, if you don't know what we're talking about, go check out day one, two, or three. One, two, and three. <laughs> Got the weekend to catch up now, you see. So then uh, Brett Gunderson, Carrie Maitland, Chet Gilmore, Steve James, Jeremy uh, Feely, and Kenneth Garrett. Expert witnesses. Here's some expert witnesses as well. So yeah, the defense says they think that they'll be finished on Monday. So that is in fact the documents I wanted to show you. And I want to show you this one Facebook post here before we dive into the trial day. Shame on January 29th of 2021. That was the day that uh, Kendi packed her bags because there was a welfare check called. Remember when she called her boyfriend, whose name is also Daniel, Prado, and then he called her parents, and then the parents called the police to have a welfare check, and then the police came up there and she packed her bag, her Victoria's Secret bag that they keep pointing out is a Victoria's Secret bag. Yeah, she packed her bag. It was said that day, and on that day, she posted, if I'm ever, this was four days before she was murdered. If I'm ever murdered, feel comfort in knowing that I ran my mouth until the bitter end. Oh my goodness. Little did she know. Four days later, she was allegedly murdered. Right? Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. I'm missing all your comments here because I'm so busy trying to power through all this. I will catch up. Okay, so let me fetch the trial footage for us. Hold on one second. Should be this one. Yeah. Okay. And as always, I've done my best to boost the court audio it's not always easy <laughs> to boost the sound and the color and everything i possibly could so that it's a nice nice-ish viewing experience this is kendy wilkins mom who's back on the stand janie okay so we ended yesterday day three finished with the state still questioning Kendi's mom, and then saying to the judge, look, we've still got lots of Facebook messages to go through. It's not going to take 10 minutes. It'll take a little longer than that. So let's go to the next day. So that's where we kick off today is still direct examination of Janie Wilkins. And let me just see quickly. That would be witness number 17, Janie Wilkins. Okay, let's see if I've still got this. Yep, I've still got the text ready for us here as well. There's a picture of Kendi. There's the defendant. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm going to make this a little smaller. Something like that. Okay, are we ready? <laughs> Who's ready for day four? Here we go. Yes. You and her having a conversation? Yes. You visited the lawyer? Yes. On January 27th of 2021? Yes. And then after the text between the two of you? Yes. And then to the 
Janet, buckles on. Buckles on. Buckle up, everyone. Some paper flapping to start <laughs> just for you. I left this in just for you. It's also played at 1.1. Oh, So much flappity flap flap. <laughs> the Cervelo says the court audio is very poor and doesn't match the quality of the video. Shame. It's a shame all round, right? I don't know why they're streaming 720p and not 1080 at least. And man, the audio really sucks. I don't know why. You know? But anyway, we've at least boosted it as best we can. Facebook messages. They just talk a little bit in between. I don't want to miss that. Let's try to go forward a bit. Yes. Texas. Yes. Are you texting your daughter on February 2nd of 2021 the day she died? Yes. Are you after texting her? Between. We don't want to miss that, so I couldn't cut out all the paper for that I've got my tea here. <laughs> I 
Yesterday we found out that Daniel Howard, the defendant, I'm just going to turn this down for you, did not want to pay a cent for the funeral, only for the cremation. That he's also never called Kendi's parents, never. After her death, which is allegedly a murder, he's never spoken to them. That was also very telling, right? Wow. Okay. Let's go forward a little more. Just right down there, call to Kendi, Kendi wrote down to Purple hair says her parents are true champs through this. Right. And then if you turn to um, the second one, B, you can write on there on the book, you to Apple, after you learn your daughter was dead, you go to Apple, you go to Apple, and you go to Apple, and you go to Apple, and you go to Apple, Get the ashes? Oh my word. All of the ashes. I didn't receive any ashes. Do you know what happened to the ashes? Yes. Did Dan have some of the ashes as well? Did what? Did Dan receive the ashes? I don't know. Are you aware of a conflict between Kennedy and Brian on the first and the second of February? Yes. Are you aware that Brian blocked Kennedy on social media? Yes. I didn't know Brian did. I knew Kennedy did. Blocked him. During that. They're referring to Kennedy's brother. Apparently, her and her brother had a fight, and we've heard before that her brother blocked her. But now her mom is saying she didn't know that the brother blocked her. She thought that Kenny blocked him. So we're not too sure what that was about. But what we do know is that the brother was in a car with the defendant, Daniel Howard. And Daniel Howard asked Kenny's brother, is she having an affair? And the brother said, yeah, she's having an affair. Because we talked about that before. Because then like a few days later, Kenny was murdered. Sure, that must feel quite hectic. That weekend, uh, you had conversations regarding uh, Kennedy and Dan filling out the divorce paperwork, right? Yes. And she specifically said that it was very really amicably, correct? I don't know. I don't remember that either. Dan paid for the body prep, correct? Yes. Paid for the casket that was used at the uh, game. I guess so. He paid for 
for the beauty. I guess. He paid for the cremation. Yes. He was not invited to the memorial card. I didn't invite him, and I don't think anybody said anything about him. Uh, he was not welcome. You were no. not walking there, right? No. If he came, there wouldn't have been any trouble. There was. That is frugal? Yes. And tried calling you guys on the morning of the third, right? No. It was on this call. Pardon? It was on this call. No. and everything and talking to Brooks, so I don't know if it had missed call. We would have answered any call. And so you had no call from Dan um, the day after no. your daughter died? No. Did you have a call from Dan the day that she did die? No. Council asked you some questions about whether or not Dan was invited to the funeral. Were the 200 people plus who came to the funeral invited, or was the date just made known and they showed up? The date was made and they showed up. We didn't invite anybody. How did you make that date of Kenny's funeral known? It was in the paper. Uh, and so anybody, anybody that could read the paper could find out what Kenny's funeral was? Yes. And could come to Kenny's funeral? Yes, it was in the Cardinal paper and the Lewiston paper. And did that posting in both those locations showed the address and the date of the funeral? Yes. And so Dan was free to come to that funeral had he wanted to? Yes. But he didn't. You mentioned that had Dan chose to come to the funeral of his wife, there would have been no trouble. Do you remember that? Yes. What do you mean by that? There wouldn't have been any trouble? Yeah. I don't know, we wouldn't have done nothing. Wouldn't have been us. Did Kenny block Brian because Brian told objection speculation. Call speculation. In response? I haven't even asked the question yet, Judge. <laughs> All right. I'll wait to hear the question. Why did Kenny block Brian? Objection call speculation. You know, lay foundation if she knows. Do you know why Kenny blocked Brian? Yes. And how did you come by that information? Kenny. When did Kenny give you that information? It was whenever Dan and Brian were going to dance dads. Was it just before uh, she died? Yes. Around February 1st of 2021? I think it was the day before. When they were on their way down. That would be February 1st. Is that? Okay. She died on February 2nd, right? Okay, but they were going down. Like, they stayed the night, then they came home, I think, the first, didn't they? I don't know. That's okay. We, we have another witness that can establish that for us. Okay. But what I'd like to know is when she told you about why she bought Brian, how did she tell you? On the phone. And can you describe her emotional state at the time she told you this? She was angry. And you never see Kendi. That's the maddest I've ever seen her. And how did that manifest itself? They blocked each other. And no, I mean, how did you know she was angry when you were talking to her? Her voice. Was it high? Mm hmm Yes? Yes. Okay. Did she seem upset about what she was telling you? Yes. Did she indicate to you when she told you about this information that she had just gotten it? Yes. Did it put her into an excited state? Yes. Did she explain why she was in that state in her statement to you about why she blocked the crime? Yes. What did she say? How would she say? If Dan or Brian's blabbing his mouth and he runs this divorce and whatever, 
I will never talk to him again. Did she be specific about how Brian may have been ruining the situation? Yeah, I think it had to do with the house. Did it have anything to do or not with Dan Crowder? Objection. Overruled. With what? Dan Crowder. Not that I know of. What happened to Kenny's ashes? Why it got half and work got half. No further questions. So at least her kids got the ashes, because I was thinking, well, who, if her parents didn't get any of the ashes, whoa. So Kendi's daughter and Kendi's son got the ashes. Uh, she had Wyatt, her son, with the defendant, Daniel Howard, and she had a daughter from a previous relationship. Thank you, ma'am. Next witness for the state. Jed Nixon. Witness number 18. You may Thank you. Could you please state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Jed Dixon, N-I-X-O-N. How are you employed? Uh, I'm an attorney. I own my own law office. What's the name of your practice? Nixon Law Office. What type of law do you practice? Uh, family law and criminal law. What percentage of your practice is between those two areas? Uh, it varies over time, but uh, probably works out roughly to a 50-50 split. Within the area of family law, what kinds of areas do you deal with? Whatever issues come up, so general uh, divorce proceedings, uh, custody modifications, uh, property settlements, financial agreements, post nuptial agreements, whatever issues can come up in that area of law, which can be quite varied. How long have you been practicing in the area of family law? Uh, roughly a little over 21 years, almost 22. Do you have any special um, licenses or certifications to do what you do? Um, I have a state bar license and 20 years of experience. And how long have you been licensed with the Idaho State Bar? Uh, 21 years, over 21 years. Do you have any other educational background? Uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Idaho, uh, law degree at the University of Idaho, um, CLEs and training through the course of the year, several courses, and uh, family law, um, I'm not going to say every year, but probably every other year. And do you engage in continuing education to stay up to date on developments in your field, your areas of the law, and maintain your ability to practice in that field? Yes. We should approach. You may. Showing you what's been marked as states 89. Do you recognize this? I do. What do you recognize this to be? My very extensive CV. Here. Is this accurate and up to date? It is. We have to admit states 89. No <laughs> What is on this page, sir? My very extensive CV. <laughs> I guess that was sarcasm, right? Because one page are there. But uh, okay, so he's an attorney. So remember that Kendi had filed for divorce. And there were actually like divorce papers on that bar counter at the house that night when the murder occurred. The alleged murder. I have to say alleged murder because that's the whole point of this trial is to prove to the jury, you know, the state's trying to prove that it was a murder, that she didn't take her own life. So yes, uh, sweet tea and sunflowers. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for being a member for seven months and welcome everyone. Happy Friday to you. Thank you so much for spending time here with us uh, watching this trial. It's always so nice to see all you guys, all the familiar faces, all the new people here as we watch this trial together. After this witness is going to be Kendi's brother. So that should be interesting.
Mr. Nixon, in talking about family law, you mentioned divorce. You also mentioned custody disputes and property disputes. Are custody disputes and property disputes often part of divorces as well? Yes. Um, sometimes they involve both. Sometimes if, if there's no uh, minor children, it's just a, a property uh, uh, issues in, in relation to the divorce. Can you describe in broad strokes the process of getting divorced in the state by Well, uh, generally uh, a party comes in and consults with uh, myself and uh, we go over the um, issues that may be involved in uh, the divorce proceeding. Um, if there are minor children, we certainly talk about that uh, and the issues surrounding child custody, child support. Um, if it's uh, property only, then we discuss the nature and bounty uh, of the uh, estate, uh, the extent of the estate's holdings, uh, the assets, the liabilities, uh, and we discuss uh, how best to divide those. If someone walks in and wants a quickie divorce, how fast could that happen? It depends. Um, some magistrates in the area, if they receive a stipulated uh, resolution by both parties, uh, it can happen fairly quickly. Um, some will wait 21 days if a party has appeared pro se uh, before they sign uh, a stipulated agreement. It depends on the judge, but I mean, realistically, the quickest you're going to get is uh, maybe a month. And just to clarify a couple of things, so magistrates would be judges that handle divorces? That's correct. And pro se would be um, someone who isn't represented by an attorney, is that correct? That is correct. And, and sometimes we have people that come in mutually or, or um, have worked out an agreement and just want an attorney to draw up the terms and conditions of their agreement. And in your um, so, Caroline White says, just arrived home after having two stents put into my blocked arteries in my heart. Oh my goodness, that is commitment. Thank you so much for being here and I hope that you feel much, much better soon. Over 20 years of experience, you are familiar with the local bar that handles di divorce cases in this area? Yes. And largely, the process that you're describing is what all attorneys in this area do? Yes. So, how does a divorce complicate or not as it relates to asset conditions? Um, well, it depends on how much, uh, how much is held by the estate, um, whether or not there's um, if it's just uh, bank accounts uh, or real property, if there is uh, in Idaho what we call separate property or community property. Uh, community property is the basis of Idaho family law, meaning that everything that is purchased, uh, not everything, but there is a presumption that anything purchased during the course of the marriage is going to be community property, meaning it's held equally by both parties. So, just to drill down on that a little bit, so what you're saying is that Regardless of who brought that asset into the marriage, it's held by both parties? That's the presumption. Um, I mean, there's obviously differences. There are, there's what's on the separate property, but the presumption in Idaho is if something is purchased during the marriage, that's going to be a community asset. So if a, a couple is married and say the, the husband works outside of the home and is the sole income earner, the wife would still be entitled to half of that monetary income? Yes. You mentioned that that is a, a quick pause, quick pause. Hello to Joe Jackalone, who's just joined us. Hello to the Sarge. You said hello, G and Grizzlies. <laughs> Grizzlies worldwide. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. And I'm looking forward to all your new quizzes. If you didn't know, you guys, Joe Jackalone has been on this channel before as a guest. He has a channel. Go check it out. And he does quizzes on his community tab, which I really like doing. Presumption. Um, what would make something separate property? Uh, if a party owns something prior to the marriage uh, and they, uh, for example, a house and uh, they, the party moved into that house, that house still maintains a sole and separate property um, characterization. Um, the party that is asserting that is their sole and separate property has a burden of overcoming the presumption of community property in Idaho or any reimbursements the state or the community may have um, to that sole and separate property. Does the presumption of community property change if you are talking about, say, an estate that has a small amount of assets versus an estate that is a high asset, say, over a million dollars? 
No, there's no monetary distinction as when it comes to community property. Have you personally handled high asset case divorce cases? Yes. Are they more complicated? They can be, not necessarily. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, you use the million dollars in North Idaho with our home price or housing prices. It's not that uncommon to have a state that may consider a value of a, a piece of uh, community property, real property, to be over a million dollars. Would personal property such as cars or boats, tractors, would those also be considered community property? Yes, any property, real, personal, um, bank accounts, so that's all community property. Would that be real property that, say, has a house on it and also, say, an empty land lot? Yes. Would that include um, fake accounts like checking and savings? Yes. Would that include retirement accounts like 401ks and Roth IRAs? Yes, as long as that uh, retirement was earned during the uh, course of the marriage. Uh, if someone had started the job prior to the marriage, uh, the income earned or put into the retirement is going to be considered uh, community property, that's where it gets to be a little complicated. There's a separate order uh, used to divide retirement accounts. So if, a, if one spouse worked for an employer for, say, 20 years, and they were also married to their spouse for that 20 years, that spouse would be entire to, entitled to half of that retirement account? Presumptively, yes. Yeah, it, under community property law, yes. What is community debt? Same idea. Uh, basically, if uh, the parties had incurred a liability, such as credit card bills, uh, mortgages, um, or any other potential debt that is going to be considered a, a, a community item that needs to be handled within the course of the divorce. So, practically speaking, how does asset division work within a divorce? Well, that's, uh, each case is, is uh, dependent upon what assets are held. If the parties are lucky enough to have more assets than liabilities, um, the, the goal is to try to divide those assets equally. Um, you can't always do that, but at least to come close as that as possible. So does that mean that everything is sold and then the money is divided? I would say that's the last resort. Um, What's the usual way? Really, with the, the help of attorneys, uh, family law in Idaho, we really try to focus on trying to resolve the case short of a trial and having a court decide. Uh, the attorneys uh, with the parties oftentimes will attend mediation and they will try to um, make sure each party has an equal share of the assets. You can't divide a house uh, in half, you can't divide a car in half. It's just uh, the goal is to try to add everything up and then make sure both parties come across, uh, come out of it relatively equal. So if you can't cut a house down the middle, how do you divide up the assets? Uh, if the house is, and again, North Idaho, we're lucky enough now that most houses are worth more than what's owed on them. Uh, you try to figure out the equity in that house, see what that number is, and uh, come to an agreement. Um, sometimes the house is sold, and that's the only way they can do it. But there are other ways to do that. You can take into considerations and in, uh, dividing the retirement accounts or the bank accounts or if they're stock or vehicles or those types of things. If there's more than one parcel of real property, there's oftentimes ways to handle a division in that manner, to have one party take certain parcels and the other party take others. Um, there are offsets that you can utilize uh, sometimes by selling things, but it's, it's, every case is different, but the goal really is to try to equalize as much as possible in most cases. And so it doesn't matter if you're offsetting, say, a house with a retirement account or a car with an empty piece of land. You're looking at those values. Is that what, what you're saying? Yes. And it, it, is that, in fact, common and the preferred method to divide assets? Yes. I, as I said, I was, generally we try to avoid having party sell items to, uh, but sometimes that's the only way to handle it. Is it? Do you ever see parties give more than they get? Yes. In what circumstances do you see that? There's value and peace of mind in resolving cases, and um, sometimes trying to um, just get the case done and, and be done is, is one time where you see parties are willing to give a little more than they take. Is sometimes getting to the divorce being finalized the goal? 
I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. So you ever come across parties who just want to be done with it? Yes, quite a, frequently. And in doing so, do they sometimes leave money on the table and just walk away with what's most important to them? Yes. Let's say that a community property had $2 million in assets. And 200000 in community debt. Would there be sufficient assets to offset the debt? Without knowing the specific nature of the assets, I, I can't say for sure, but um, for example, if you have a house that's worth 1.8 million of that, then it might be a little difficult, but if you have other assets, um, there likely would be a, a way to work uh, through that with an equal, an equal settlement. Now you mentioned that divorce proceedings sometimes can take a while. What happens if the assets or the debt within the community changes in that period of time where the parties are trying to sort this out? They often do, and it depends on why it changed. If well, let me ask you this. Why does it often change? People have to live their lives. They have to move on. Uh, they have to uh, plan for the next stage of their life, whether that's um, incurring everyday debt that we have to incur, uh, if your car breaks down and you have to fix it, uh, or arranging new housing if the parties are separated. Um, you, you got to move forward, and uh, as I say, divorces can happen quickly, but they can also, if uh, contested, they can take a while. It can take uh, sometimes over a year. If one party were, say, to leave... I think sometimes it could take like five years or something, right? I've heard of that. Pilots used to get divorced a lot. <laughs> it always looked very, very stressful. Oh, my goodness. Doesn't this just seem like the nicest uh, attorney, <laughs> like a nice divorce attorney? So... You know, he's so calm, he seems so kind, right? Very, very good guy to have around in a situation like that. Because divorces, there's obviously a lot of tension and stuff, right? I wish they could ask him, like, how dumb is it that this defendant, instead of divorcing and having peace of mind, did this, allegedly. My goodness. Introduce new community debt during the pendency of a divorce. Can that be sorted through? But frequently that happens, yes, absolutely. Do you know Dan or Kendi Powell? I do not. Have you ever represented them? No. Were you asked to review any police reports or facts in this case? Not generally, no, not specifically. No other questions, thank you. Thank you. Any questions on this? Not briefly. Morning, Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> Now, um, do clients ever come in? He's like, good morning, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> See a little bit of a tiny bit of snark in there or what? Okay, so cross-examination is actually happening. I thought he said no questions. Okay, here we go. Did that happen before before that don't understand the process? That is probably the, the normal case, yes. There's a lot of misconceptions about uh, if there's infidelity, do they get more or less, right? Uh, did you say misconceptions about that? Yes. Uh, I would say that's fair, absolutely. Um, in general, it, this is a no-fault state, right? In general, yes. There are still fault-based grounds. Yeah. But uh, having an affair wouldn't change the 50 community split, would it? I, that's hard to say. It depends how the action is, is uh, pled in the petition, actually. Now, the uh, large states, you said it's not uncommon in over 20, uh, 20 some years. We've been doing family law through that whole time. Yes. And it's not uncommon to have large estate divisions. Large estate divisions? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Yes, division of large states. Yeah, no, it's not uncommon. You practice, Council asked you about your practice. You practice criminal defense and family law. Correct. Is the pay structure different in those two? Objection relevance? Mm -hmm. Pass by around. It, it wasn't.
got an objection there again. Forensic Fury says, why do we all, <laughs> why are we all like, ah, oh, here goes, here goes Jason again. <laughs> I think it's just what we do sometimes, right? The defense attorney is like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> but he's doing his job. He's doing a good job at his job. Eileen uh, Barnard has been a member for 29 months. Oh my goodness. Oh gee, original Grizzly. And thank you so much for your kind message and wishes. And yes, we've got the best community. Thank you so much. <laughs> You said earlier that the goal is to avoid a trial, correct? I mean, generally, that's my goal. I don't know about every attorney, but I'm going to try to help my clients avoid that process. Now, the longer a family law matter drags out, the more it costs either the client or the state, right? Again, it depends upon the nature of the agreement between the client and the attorney. There are attorneys that on occasion I do flat fees for divorces. Is it more common to do it by the hour? Um, I honestly don't know. Uh, as far as other attorney practices, I would say most do have some form of hourly representation agreement, although some will take a chunk up front for a flat fee and a, a, another amount for later for trial. Now, one of the first things that you would do when a client comes and asks about a divorce is ask if it's going to be amicable or not. Right. Um, sometimes you can usually tell just by talking to the client whether or not it's going to be um, a fight or whether or not the parties have talked. But sometimes they don't really indicate one way or the other. And if it is going to be amicable, um, you'd want them to provide a list of who's getting what to put into the paperwork. Is that right? When you say them, I, I assume you're talking about my clients. I would say yes, in general, people know. Okay, um, it, it's pretty rare to have two people come in together. I just say as a husband and wife, or any other form of a husband and wife, wife. But um, it, could you repeat the question? Yes. Sir. So when a client comes in, they say it's going to be amicable, but they want you to do the people. Would you want them to give you a list of what's being split, what assets are being split? Yes, specifically. Generally, what they uh, generally when it comes to at least title items where legal documentation would be necessary in order to remove one party from an asset, you would want to ensure to include that in the divorce judgment. So, for instance, a uh, real property has to be included in a, in a divorce. Uh, yes, it should be absolutely. And if it's not, it would be an omitted asset that could be brought up later. Uh, potentially, yes, uh, for the purposes of ownership and mortgages and any money tied to it, you would absolutely want to cover that in the divorce. Thank you. Can you read right? Concessions, whether that's about how an affair could influence the divorce or whether a particular piece of real property would be included in the divorce. Is it not your role as an attorney to answer those questions? Absolutely. And if the client went home and, and thought of the question, would they call you? It happens all the time. Your clients call you a lot? Uh, yes. <laughs> no other questions. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Give me a second. Thank you, Eric. Brian Wilkins is next. All right. <laughs> Brian Wilkins. So that is Candy's brother. Now, let's hear what he's got to say. Good morning, sir. Are you Brian Wilkins? Yes. Can you come forward, please? Can you please face my clerk and raise your right hand this morning? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So yes. help you back. Thank you, sir. You have a seat there in the witness stand. As we try your best to speak in the microphone so we can hear you all. Okay. Right. Thank you. You may inquire. Thank you, Judge. Sir, can you say your whole name and spell your last? Brian Wilkins. W-I-L-K-I-N-S. Who is your mom and dad? Jamie and Wendell. 
And we heard from Janie and Wendell yesterday and also Janie today. So we've heard from Kendi's parents. Sorry to pause it like that. There you go. <laughs> we heard from Kendi's parents so far. This is this is her brother. And then we're also going to hear from her daughter, Brooke. I don't know if we're going to hear from her son, uh, Wyatt. April Showers, thank you so much for your $20 super sticker. You said happy birthday, Gizla. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. There's actually a lot of Grizzlies having birthdays, so happy birthday to all of you who are sharing a birthday month with me. Just a little closer. Sorry, the acoustics in this room are not fantastic. Who was your sister? Kimmy. Where'd you grow up? Kimmy. Hi, Kimmy. Okay. And growing up, were you close to your sister? Yes, very close. As you got older, um, were you still close to your sister? Yes. Are you familiar with Dan Howard? Yes. He's here today? Yeah. Can you please point him out? Describe where he's seated. Tell us what he's wearing. Uh, blue coat, white shirt. When did you get to know Dan Howard? Uh, early 90s, when they got together. And through the course of the 90s and the 2000s, um, did you at times go up to Athol and stay with him? At that time, we lived in Lowstead and uh, Powell. And during that time, I was helicopter long, so I was gone quite a bit. I'm talking about um, the years through the 90s into the 2000s. Yeah. Did you ever go to their house in Athol for any reason? Yes. What, what kinds of reasons? Uh, holidays, birthdays, okay. just to go visit. All right. And did you become acquainted with Dan at least somewhat? Yes. What was Dan's, to your knowledge, based on your being around him, attitude towards money? It was very tight, cheap. What kind of uh, person was your sister? Was she outgoing or not? <coughs> yeah, she was very outgoing. Uh, fun to be around. Okay. Are you familiar with Candy's attitude growing up with her and being around her towards guns? Uh, I don't believe she liked my never seen her hand to one or. Uh, be interested in that. Were you around enough um, towards the end of Kim's life? Last couple of years she was married to Dan. What their relationship was like? Um, they fought a lot, argued a lot. Uh, you wasn't really good. Did you give your sister any advice? I asked her how much they just going to get a divorce the way they fought all the time. Did you have a hand in Dan Howard getting a job up in Alaska? Yeah, I, he uh, applied to places and I gave recommendations. Um, small area up there, I know most of the companies. And so were you working up there on the North Slope uh, before Dan started working up there? Yes. How long have you been working up there? Uh, probably 10 years or 12 years before he started. Okay. Well, what do you do up there? Private equipment, trucks, things like that. What sort of uh, work schedule do you have? I do a three weeks on, three weeks off. Okay. And when you're not working, where do you live? Lewiston, Idaho. When you're working up there, describe a typical day. Uh, get up, go eat. You work 12 hour days minimum. Go back to your so little it, room and do it all over again the next day. So like a dorm like yes. living situation? Yeah, and you should have. Most Places the bathrooms are communal down the hall, and you got a cafeteria and you know things like that, just like a dorm in college, basically. Okay. And so, going to say the end part of December 2020, January 2021, what was your work schedule? And what was Dan's work schedule? Uh, we were working the same schedule, but he was on night shift, I was on day shift. Okay. And so, when did you come back? Your sister died on February 2nd, right? 2021? Yes. yes. When did you come down before that? I got home on the 28th of January, I believe. Okay. Do you know when Dan got back? I believe the night before. On the 27th? I believe so. Okay. 
on February 1st, 2021, did you agree to travel to Lucille with Dan? Yes, I did. How did that happen? Um, he told me before he left Slope that he had had his movement and needed help moving some stuff around in the shops and things like that. Did you agree to help? Yes, I did. And this time on February 1st, in stretching back beyond that, were you friends with Dan? Yeah, I mean, we did things. I mean, we weren't tight, I don't feel. I mean, we, you know, spent time on holidays, you know, fished a few times, hunted a few times. And, okay. You know, mostly it was with my sister and the family was there. Right. And so on February 1st, did Dan pick you up? Yes, he did. What, what is, where did he pick you up? Pick up my house around uh, 11, 12 in the morning. Okay, and so he is driving what? His pickup. Okay, and you drove down from Alpha to pick you up from Lewiston? Yes. And from where, from Lewiston, where did you go? We went down to Lucille, to where his dad was. So Lucille is south of Grangeville, south of Whitebird, down along the what river? Uh, Salmon River. Salmon River, okay. And that's a couple hour ride from Lucille? Yeah, so? an hour and a half to hours. Okay. What did, what did you and he talk about on the way down? Uh, basically, uh, what was going on, uh, he asked me if Cindy had a boyfriend. Uh, we stopped and looked at some property he was wanting to buy if, when the divorce got done. Uh, where was this property? Um, Slate Creek. Okay. That's on the way down to the yeah, yeah. It's off 95? Yeah, about a few miles from Whiteford. Okay. Did he ask a lot of questions about Cindy? Yeah, mostly about if she had a boyfriend. Okay. And... Did it seem to you that he was suspicious of her having a boyfriend? Yes, he was very suspicious. Did the talk, was he persistent in asking you whether or not she had a boyfriend? Yes. And did you give him more information the more persistent he got? I don't believe so because I didn't know um, about the boyfriend. I had a suspicion I asked and I was told no, they were just friends. And so I looked at that, you know. Who was your suspicion? Daniel Carter. Okay. How did you come by that suspicion? Um, my parents do concessions at auctions, and I was there, and just, I just, they were spending a lot of time talking and stuff, and I just kind of a thought. Okay. I know you, you say you didn't tell Dan who Kenny was having an affair with, but did you tell Dan who you had suspicious yes, I of, of who Kenny was having an affair with? Yes. So who did you tell Dan Kenny was having an affair with in terms of your suspicions? Dan the problem. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me for a second. And that was the day before. I mean, damn, the state, in my opinion, is proving their case. The day before, because they said February 1st. You know, they both worked in Alaska. This is Kenny's brother and then Kenny's husband, Daniel Howard. The one she was divorcing, they worked in Alaska together. Three weeks on, three weeks off is what I think they said the schedule was. Same schedule, just Dan working night shift and Brian working day shift. But then he says that Dan would have gotten back home around the 27th and uh, Brian would have got home around the 28th. So then they're driving around together on the 1st and Dan, Daniel Howard, the husband, was pushing Brian the whole time for answers on is Candy having an affair? Does she have a boyfriend? Like just asking, asking, asking. And he's like, I don't know, I think so. And obviously pushing for more answers, who do you think it is and all that. And it would be Daniel Prado, who's a guy that she knew since high school already. And they had rekindled their relationship and he seemed like a really nice guy he was on the stand um on the second day i think it was so wow to, the day before to be asking like that that's motive huh if you ask me uh lupo nina thank you so much you said happy birthday g and no worries so thank you thank you so much i appreciate it so much thank you for being here okay so 
He also didn't know. So I, I'm now trying to recall who said, was it the defense attorney in the opening statement? Someone said that, you know, that uh, Kenny's brother told Dan that she was having an affair. But he doesn't seem to quite know. He just suspected, right? Wow. Shame. Showing him something, or did he end up showing you something? He showed me a printout of the house that Kenny was looking at in Kenny, uh, and it had Daniel's picture there up because it was his uh, site, his uh, cell. So did Dan have this real estate posting with Dan Prado's face on it with him? Yes. When he broke down with you? Yes. Where did he, where did he bring it from? A pocket from his truck? I mean, how did it suddenly materialize? He had one of those yellow legal note thing pads. Uh, like this in there? Yes. Tucked in there. Yeah. And where was this pad in the truck? Uh, on the console or right there in the seat. Yeah, 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 professional auntie says, <laughs> I wonder if you're American, if you say professional auntie, I want to say professional auntie. <laughs> I feel sorry for the brother if a couple of days after confirming she had a boyfriend, she ended up in her life like a day later. Is what they're saying. That is so scary. He, it must feel very shocking for him, right? To be like, oh my word. Like this guy was asking, asking, pushing, pushing. And he said, yeah, yeah, I think I think she is having an affair. I think she's got a boyfriend. Well, he said, I think she's got a boyfriend. Both of them were moving on. Both of them buying properties, of course, as you heard. Now we also heard that Daniel Howard was also looking at pro uh, properties to buy. So he very much knew, yes, the divorce is on. You are splitting. And apparently, you know, he he was okay with it. It's from January 29th or so, yeah, he accepted it and he was okay with it. No, he wasn't, right? No, he wasn't. Wow. Um, Rachel says, is it an affair if they were split up? Yeah, is it? Is it? And if he was a DV aggressor for so long? Hmm. Um. Shame, man. Yes, it's similar. You're going to stick this on the old one? Did you eventually get down to Lucille that evening? 
Yes. What happened in those seating? Really nothing. His dad wasn't ready to move stuff, so we just talked and ate dinner. So you drove down there for no reason? Pretty much. Other than to have this conversation with Dan on the way down to the seal? Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. That evening, where did you sleep? Oh, um, upstairs in one of the spare bedrooms. Okay. And exactly who all was there? Uh, Dan, his dad, myself, and another man that I don't remember his name. Okay. Do you know whether or not Dan slept that night? Didn't sound like very much. You could hear him in his room moving around. And you could hear noises from his room. Oh. Where was his room in relationship to your room? Uh, just kitty corner from mine. You have wood floors? I don't recall. Did you hear him walking around at all or not? Yes, I did. What period of the night did you hear him walking around? Most of the night. Before the group of you uh, went to sleep, was there a conversation about Dan and Dan getting a divorce? Oh, the next morning, me and his dad had brought it up after it was getting ready to leave. Okay. Where did it happen that you brought this up? At the dinner table. Okay. Have a copy. And did Dan participate in the conversation? Yes. Can you tell us what he said? He didn't really say much. We just told him, you know, it sounded like it's time to move on. You know, that she wanted a divorce. And he really didn't have much to say. Okay. How was Dan acting that morning? Agitated, anxious to get home. So this is the morning of February 2nd, 2021? Yes. Now what time do you think you left the seat? the day of the alleged murder on that morning so he didn't sleep much that last night is what it sounds like he was pacing up and down you know really, really agitated by this it sounds like really jealous as well even though he knew that they were getting divorced as in dan knew that him and his wife were getting a divorce and it actually could have happened way sooner because seven months prior he had that uh, there was that incident where he got this dom domestic battery charge from I mean, it sounds like the DV went on for quite some time. It could have gone on for the whole relationship, for all we know. Imagine if it did. Then it took 27 years for her to finally be like, you know what? I'm going to leave. Like, finally, I'm going to leave. I'm going to get a house. I'm going to get a hot tub. I'm going to be with the right guy, someone that actually treats her with respect. And it sounds like Dan Howard was just like, hell no. And of course, he wanted all the money as well. He was very, as everyone said, controlling with the money, tight with the money and he had his little list there at his bar counter calculating all the finances so uh, also savannah says about to take you guys on a dog walk i like that i like it when you guys take us with you wherever you're going that is so nice <laughs> thank you so much okay. uh we left i think it was pretty early like seven or eight we went and had breakfast in rivets okay was it just you and dan that had breakfast or no all four of us okay and from there did you leave and then we had to come back and get our gas picked up and left from Lucille. About what time? Probably 10. Okay. Had Dan told you he wanted to leave earlier than that? Yeah, as soon as we woke up, he was ready to leave. And what time was that? Uh, I think it went downstairs around 5, 5.30. In the morning? Yes. And how did he express his desire to leave that early in the morning? Uh, we didn't have nothing to do, so he was just ready to go. So you didn't really work down there at all? Not that I recall because his dad wasn't ready to move stuff around. I'm just going to uh, pause quickly. So Austin D said, but the brother knew about the abuse between them and the divorce. I wonder how much the family knew because the um, her mom also said, you know, they thought everything was great until much later. You know, maybe until July, maybe even until January 29th was how do we know, you know, if they knew. Maybe Kendi kept it all to herself, you know? Shame. But uh, you said, knew about the abuse between them and the divorce. Why would he ride around with Dan? Well, they work together, right? And dump fuel on the fire. I have five sisters. I'd never do that. I guess, without blaming the brother, we try to take lessons out of these cases, right? And a lesson would be, never underestimate 
anyone going through a divorce and what they would do out of rage or jealousy or anything. Rather don't ever say anything that could add fuel to the fire. You just actually don't know how unhinged someone can be, as we can see in this case. You know, I'm sure if the brother knew that Dan Howard was that unhinged that he would actually murder his sister, allegedly, he wouldn't have told him that. But that's the thing, never underestimate how unhinged someone could be. You just don't know. Describe the trip back to Lewis. Pretty quiet. Dan was texting. I figured my sister, and it was pretty quiet, not awkward. Why was it awkward? Just because it was so quiet, and uh, you know, you could tell he was upset and upset because uh, whatever, probably this texting about so, and. I'm just gonna I'm gonna pause one more time here quickly. Um, so someone also said Michelle McDonald said apparently the most dangerous time period for a DV victim is leaving. Absolutely, that's exactly what the stats say. We discussed that a lot on this channel. Lots of DV cases. This is another domestic violence case, right? Which is so sad. And that's the point of education, sharing information, sharing the DV distress signal, all of that. Because you don't, we can't assume that her brother knew that there was DV in the relationship or that he knew the dangers of it that he knew that separation was the most dangerous time. Not everyone knows that, you know what I mean? We watch true crime all day, every day, all the time, and we're trying our very best to educate ourselves and keep people safe and try to save lives, but that's the point of sharing the information with your friends, with your kids, with your family members, uh, teaching people, because they might not actually know, you know, how dangerous it can be, especially if there was DV going on, and maybe it only comes to light now, like in this case, like, wait a minute, what? You know, because victims would often keep it to themselves. They would suffer in silence or in plain sight. She was in a bikini with her chest all bruised right after that July attack of 2020. Right? So, yeah, that would be a lesson. If it's, uh, you know, if you don't know about the abuse or whatever it is, in divorce situations or separation, it's a very dangerous time. People can be very unhinged. So just be careful what information you give them. Even if you just, maybe the brother was just like trying to get it through to him. Like, it's really over. <laughs> like, you guys are going to get divorced. Like, let's just do the logical thing. Just get divorced, move on with your lives. Everybody be happy. I would assume, I'm assuming that the brother would be like that. Just like, oh, okay. You know, for peace of mind, just sign the papers, do your thing. Everybody move on. Everybody be happy. But unfortunately, the defendant, Daniel Howard, sounded completely unhinged. And look what he did, apparently. Uh -huh. Just what was going on, probably. How was his driving? Uh, he was texting, so he was all he was swerving up around the road. What do you mean swerving around? The road? Just you know, would drive off towards the ditch or across the center line. Just it was. Was he driving on the speed limit? Yeah. How much over the speed limit? Probably ten or fifteen. I think it's only sixty up there. Was he driving recklessly on the way home? Uh, yeah, probably. Just not paying attention. Was that because he was agitated? I feel so. Over candy? I'm sure. When you got to Lewiston, what happened? Uh, he dropped me off. Uh, we talked a little bit, me and my girlfriend. He left. Did you tell Dan you were coming up the next day on February 3rd, <clears throat> 2021? Yes, I did. I was going to go talk to my sister. Did you tell him why? Because I wanted to get her side of the story because I didn't know what was going on, you know, and about the boyfriend and what she was doing, nobody had told me anything about it. And she blocked you from some social media at that point? Yes, some way that. Why? Uh, I'm not really sure what was being said. She just told me to text me to go fuck myself and that was that. Was it because she thought that you had told Dan about a problem? More than likely I heard I was told that by my mom because they were texting each other. How many times did you tell Dan now that you were going to come up and see your sister on February 3rd? Quite a few. I, mean, I, I believe I even said it before we left the slope. I was going to come see her. How about it? Why did you tell Dan how so many times that you were going to go up personally see your sister on February 3rd? Uh, just because the conversation kept coming up that she wanted to divorce and, and uh, things like that. So, you know. On February 1st, when you told Dan Howard on the way back that you were going to see your sister the next day, on February 2nd, when you were driving back and told Dan Howard that you were going to see your sister the next day on February 3rd, did you tell Dan not to hurt your sister? 
I asked him on the way down if he'd ever hurt my sister because of the stuff we was talking about, and uh, I just was kind of concerned. How many times did you tell Dan not to hurt your sister in February? <clears throat> See, he's asking, have you ever hurt my sister? We can't assume he knew about the domestic violence going on. He was starting to ask, you know, and he seems actually like a really protective guy. I'm sure if he knew, he would have been very protective. You know, shame, man. I feel sorry for him. And remember, it's not this guy's fault. It's not anyone's fault for saying something or it's not Kendi's fault. It's not, we're not victim blaming or blaming the family or anything. It's purely, according to what we know so far in this trial, what the charges are, it's purely Daniel Howard's fault for what happened here. Right? I know the defense is going with that she took her own life. I don't believe that. So, in my opinion, it's a homicide. And therefore, the only one to blame is Daniel Howard. Never mind. And that's for, like, the one day with the murder. What about all the other days? What about all the other incidents with abuse? It's terrible. I just asked him if he had hurt my sister. The one time going down, and then later. The next day? The I asked him the morning that they, my sister is dead. I asked him before I left his house. No, we're about to get to that soon. Did he contact you that same day in February 2nd after he dropped you off? Yeah, he did in the afternoon asked if I heard from Kindy because he, she had to come home from work yet. Did you and he have a conversation? I believe it was just a text. I don't think it was much. In the afternoon of February 2nd? Yeah. Okay. Did you have any other contact with him on the second? No. Okay, so let's go to the, the next day on February 3rd. Did you have any contact with Dan that day? He called like at 6 in the morning, said she's gone, and I asked what was he talking about. She said he was gone, and then he hung up. Did you say anything other than she's gone before he hung up on No. Did you try to call him back? <clears throat> no, because uh, I just. I think my dad called me, I called my dad, and then they told me. Okay. After hearing what they told you, did you make a decision? Yes, I was already getting dressed to go up there. So did you drive that morning on February 3rd to Apple News? Yes. By yourself? No, I don't want to. Okay. When you got to the Howard residence, <clears throat> what happened? Uh, I parked, Wyatt came out, and uh, Said his dad was inside the in the kitchen there and uh, was real distraught and I just walked in. Alright, so you walk into the walk to the front door and go to the kitchen living room area? Yeah, but he was downstairs at okay. by the wood stove bar area. Alright. Um about what time on your green this was? Probably around eleven. Now, you've known Dan a very long time, it sounds like. Yeah. Dan, the type of man that when he greets you, he looks you in the eye and shakes your hand? Yes. He, would, would he invariably do that over the many years that you've known him when you and he would meet? For every, the first time? every time. Every time he firm handshake, look in the eye. And did that happen on February 3rd at his residence? No, it did not. Describe what happened. Uh, we sat there for a while. Dan was like covering his eyes and leaned up against the bar. I sat there for a while. I reached out to shake his hand. Didn't shake it very firm. I asked him again if he had ever hurt my sister. He never made eye contact. He just said no. I gave him a little bro hug and we left. Interesting behavior that we're hearing from Dan that morning, huh? Even though we saw quite the performance on body cam yesterday. If you missed it, you got to see some of that. I was telling Mr. Grizzly all about it today. I'm like, and then. <laughs> then it was like he was howling at the moon. <laughs> it's such a performance. Brian W. said, we all need to get better at recognizing coercive control in all aspects of our lives. I agree. I agree. To me, it was life-changing, yeah. Laura Richards' course on coercive control. Yeah, I learned a lot. And I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So I agree. Were you able to see 
Dan's face at all when he came up to his, to his house and he walked downstairs to where he was sitting at the bar? <clears throat> no, he was kind of bent over the bar uh, with his hands on the bar and his face down in his hands. So he was covering his face up for Yeah. Did you see any tears or anything like that? No, when I shook his hand, he was, I didn't see no tears. Did he have any expression on his face whatsoever when his one hand left to shake yours? No. Wow, another one who didn't see any tears. I mean, we couldn't see any glistening tears at all either. He was just barking and howling and putting on a real performance there, huh? On that body cam in front of the cops. To the 911 dispatcher, to the cops standing there for a long time. It felt like forever, right? <laughs> and even to Kendi's brother. Can't look at him. No tears though. Like, oh wow. Did you go to Kenny's funeral? Yes, I did. Where was that? Kami, I have the church. How many people came about? I'd say a couple hundred. Did they know? No. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Cross-examination, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Henry. <clears throat> now, Dan has given new recommendations for you. Is your current job, is that right? He was used as a reference. Okay. Your sister holding you up, right? I don't know. But your, your <laughs> demeanor change here. <laughs> the defense attorney is like, morning. He's just like, I didn't see a morning back. And it's just like, mm hmm, ready for these questions. <laughs> when you went down to the seal, you were you stopped to look at property. Yes. And that was in anticipation of divorce. Right? Yes. The plan as was indicated that he would they would both move. I assume so if he was looking at the property. And he said that he drove you back to Lewiston. He went into your house when he dropped you off, right? Yes. He spent about 10, 15 minutes there. Probably. Now, the, he talked about eye contact and his handshake. In your years of looking him in the eye and having him shake your hands, had he ever lost his wife? Before. No. <laughs> I don't know if the snark he is. This brother is like, <laughs> ridiculous question, Jason. Did you see that? Where, 108, where we wait. Look at this, the last few seconds here. Probably. Now, the talked about eye contact and his handshake. In your years of looking him in the eye and having him shake your hands, had he ever lost his wife before? Look, look, look. No. <laughs> I just love that eye roll. <laughs> just eye roll the defense attorney. Just like, oh, whatever, bro. <laughs> wow, okay. So Carrie is asking, someone asked, I did do it earlier. I put the message on the screen and I demonstrated it. Did you see it? This is the DV distress signal. Okay. I show it a lot on this channel. It's very important to teach to everyone, you know, because what if you're out and about and you see someone do that and you don't know what it means? It's a distress signal. It was created as a domestic violence distress signal. So if you see somebody just like looking and quickly doing that uh, they're asking for help they're asking you to call the police or to call speak to the manager or something so that they can get out of that situation you know but rather don't intervene yourself call the police is the right thing to do or call a manager or report look at the license plate number or whatever it is in the situation there's many situations where you could see that but it's a distress signal so sometimes people are being abducted and then they're in the car and then they're showing this hand signal where they can and luckily, people know what that means. So they call the police, they get that license plate number, they give them the info, and they save lives, okay? Very important to share that. Okay. So, 
that was a good moment there of the snark. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, George. Sir, can you say your whole name and spell your last? Yes, my name is Matthew Rakes, R-A-K-E-S. How are you employed? I'm currently an attorney. I'm self-employed. Whereabouts? Uh, here in Coeur How long have you been an attorney? Since, I've been practicing since 2014. What sort of work have you been doing over the last 10 years? Primarily family law stuff, so divorces and custody, those sorts of things. Okay. Back in January of 2021, where were you working? I was working for a local firm here in Coeur d'Alene, uh, Amendola, Doty, and Brumley. Does that firm um, have a side to it that practices family law? It does. Is that what you were doing there in 2021? Yes. How long had you been at that firm back in January of 2021, approximately? I began working there in, in January of 2016, so whatever the math of that works out to, five years approximately. All right. Working for that law firm in terms of family law, was there a procedure that you followed based upon what they wanted you to do in terms of when you're talking to a new client that may want a divorce or some sort of child custody um, change? Yes. What was the procedure that you followed with basically every family law um, potential client? So essentially that, that potential client would call in and set an appointment uh, that would get on the calendar. They'd come in, they'd fill out some initial kind of intake paperwork uh, and then come up and, and meet with whichever attorney they were, they were meeting with, myself or whoever else it was, uh, and have a, a, a conversation for, I don't know, half hour, an hour or something like that. Uh, and depending on how that went, we would either give them some additional paperwork if there was if it looked like they were intending to retain, or if um, if there was nothing further, then we would just wait and see if they called back or whatever. So, if you thought that there was a possibility they were going to retain you, what sort of paper, paperwork would, they, would you give them? Depends on the case a little bit, but typically in a divorce, it has to do with things related to uh, property division or custody issues. Uh, so essentially, we had a packet of information that would include um, their name, their address, um, information about how they wanted to divide property. In other words, kind of an inventory of property, an inventory or a schedule of debts. Uh, if there was children involved, it would involve some custody determinations, things like that. So part of this paperwork, it sounds like, included a division of property that they were supposed to fill out. Is that accurate or not? That's correct. Okay. And these clients then that would come in that you actually gave paperwork to, you would instruct them how to fill that out and to so list their assets. Correct. Would you instruct them to give a ballpark of what each asset was worth? Yes, on that form, uh, typically the form we use is kind of a, almost like a spreadsheet sort of thing where it has the item and then there's a few lines of stuff that they have to fill out, including who they want to receive that property, any debt that's owed on the property, and uh, the approximate value of the property. Okay. On January 26th of 2021, did you meet with Kendi Howard? I did. And did this occur at your former employer's in the Doty? It did. What was the nature of the meeting with Kendi Howard? It was a consult for a divorce. Okay. Can you run us through what happened, please? So generally she came in, uh, so the way it was set up in my office was upstairs at the building. I would come down into the into the front lobby uh, and get the person who was waiting kind of in our waiting area. I'd introduce myself, uh, I'd bring him up. So that's what happened with her. I brought her up to my office. Uh, we had a conversation. It's pretty typical of the way I have those conversations where I kind of narrow down what the issues are. So one of the first things I ask is how long someone's been married, uh, if they're still together or if they're separated, are there any children involved? And if so, uh, what's, what's, what's the nature of that? There wasn't any children involved in this case. I like the pace at which he speaks, right? <laughs> very nice. We are in 1.1 speed, but it's very good. And then we move on to start talking about assets, whether there's real estate, whether there's retirement accounts, bank accounts, all that sort of stuff. And then discuss kind of uh, what the Idaho law talks about with those things in terms of um, in terms of, of community property and how those things are likely to be divided by the court and what that stuff looks like. Okay, so the conversation you had with Kendi Howard covered all those aspects, of uh, division of property, community property in Idaho, what would happen with their assets? All of those topics were covered between me and Kendi? It, it was, yes. Okay. If you remember, can you describe for us uh, her demeanor in terms of a potential divorce? Um, she was nervous coming into that a little bit um, a little bit hesitant to discuss some things which is not uncommon you know it's always a, a difficult thing when people are talking about their personal situation um, but she was she was nervous about that um, and and you know had some questions about the property division and what that might look like and about um, 
you know, what, what, what would happen during a potential separation while the court, while the case was pending about whether or not, you know, they sold property or bought property or things like that. So we had some, some conversations about that stuff. Uh, and during that, she was she was kind of more engaged and interested in what we were talking about and a little less, a little less nervous about that. At some point, did the issue of how a recently purchased house in Camiac come up or not? Now, I can't remember. There was there was a discussion of a house uh, that I believe was in Camiac. I can't remember the exact location, and I can't recall if it was if if she had recently purchased or or was considering purchasing it. But we did discuss the implications of that. Yes. And, and you filled her on. You, I guess, guided her on the law in terms of potential piece of property that was bought during the divorce. Correct. I, I informed her that you know while the marriage is still existing, even if a divorce has been filed, it's still considered community property. So the court's going to consider the division of that of that asset. And so she left your office knowing that on January 26th. Yes. Would you characterize her demeanor in talking with her as scared or not? I would. Characterize it as what? As, as scared. I would characterize it as that. Let me show you some exhibits. Shame. She was scared, but so excited to move on. You know, for her, she must have been like visualizing like i'm actually gonna get away from this guy an abuser i'm gonna buy a property and a hot tub i'm gonna get my nails done and actually go for a mommy makeover as they said and have a new life shame man and she absolutely deserved that daniel howard was like hell no that's not happening so jealous so controlling right allegedly based on what we've heard they've already been in can I approach Judge? Come on. Mr. Riggs, just given the CD, you may need, if you want to step into the well, if it's easier to refer to the photos, you're welcome to do so. Pull this around this direction. Okay, Mr. Riggs, you're looking at what's already been admitted as 35A. Do you recognize that group of people in the A, B, and B beneath it? I do. What do you recognize that group of people to be? That is, well, myself in there and then the other attorneys that worked at Amadola Dodi and Brahma. And so would that have been part of the pamphlet or paperwork that you would send someone away who you consulted with for a divorce? Um, very possibly. I don't remember specifically if that, if anything with that image is in there. Certainly things with the logo, but I don't remember specifically if that image is in there. Okay. And then the next one I wanted to show you is 36D. Do you recognize that paperwork without necessarily recognizing the handwriting inside? I do recognize the paperwork. What do you recognize that paperwork to be? That is part of that paperwork I was discussing um, that we provide to, to potential clients to fill out that includes name, address, uh, the information. There's additional pages to that that include those property division uh, issues that we spoke about. Okay, and that would be included in the pamphlet that you would send a potential client away with? Correct. Um, I think we're done with the exhibits. If you want to retake your seat, that would be great. And then one more to show you. It's already been admitted as 16. Recognize that? I do. That's one of the, it's kind of a maroon, essentially like folder that we would put those paperwork in for potential clients and give them to them to take home. Okay. And that would have been something she would have received on January 26, 2021? Yes. Damn, she received that on January 26th of 2021, and he had stood over her wearing all black and black gloves, and that sounded like a, a practice round of sorts on January 29th, just three days later. And that was what was found on that uh, bar counter of his the night of the alleged murder, the morning of, actually. You know, they showed pictures of that bar area yesterday, and that was the folder that they showed. So that would be her folder, you know, for divorce. Wow. Did you set up a follow-up appointment with Kim? I don't recall that I did, uh, but that's not uncommon. Did you expect her to come back? I expected her to complete the paperwork and return it and pay her retainer and move forward with the process, yes. And she did not? That's correct. No further questions. Thank you. Press examination, Mr. Johnson. Briefly, Your Honor, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Is it common for clients that come in to talk about divorce to be nervous? It is. Um, 
<clears throat> and then there's a two-part process on becoming a client. There's the initial intake. Correct. And then after they sign an agreement and pay the retainer, they become a client. Correct. Um, she had not signed an agreement or paid the retainer. That's correct. No further questions. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, Judge. Hope you're enjoying the defluffing. <laughs> so you just go from one witness to the next. Wow, so she hadn't signed an agreement or paid the retainer yet, but she had filed, she was busy starting up, you know, the filings for the divorce. So, wow, for really just a hint of the divorce or that it's like, oh, wow, this is actually happening, and Dan Howard was not having it. Wow. <laughs> Forensic Fury says, Jason is so good at stating the obvious. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, yeah, Phoebe says, Jason believes that makes a difference. Okay, so here's our next witness, which is witness number 21, I think. Sir, can you say your whole name and spell both your first and last names? Bryant Keith Gunnerson, B-R-Y-A-N-T, G-U-N-N-E-R-S-O-N. -N -E can you tell us how you're employed, sir? I am a special agent with the FBI and have been so for almost 19 years. Where are you stationed? I am located here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And have been for how long? For the, the majority of my career outside of my training in Quantico. Do you have a specialization within the FBI? Yes, I do. What is that? I work primarily white collar crimes. Um, due to my background, I graduated with a degree, with my master's degree in accounting. I am also a certified fraud examiner and have been so, I believe it's about eight years. So in terms of... Um, FBI Special Agent Bryant Gunnarsson. Okay, this should be interesting. Um, your education, you have a BS, is that accurate? Uh, yes, I have an undergrad and a master's and in accounting. Your undergrad is in accounting? Yes. Master's is in what? Accounting. And then you are a certified fraud, what was the term? Examiner. Examiner. How long have you been so certified? I believe it's been about eight years. Okay, how did it come about that you did that? What did it take? It took me, um, I basically had to pass an exam um, with the, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically the entity that creates an exam on fraud, and you basically have to learn what the terms are, what different types of fraud there are, and how those things would be investigated. All right. I've got here what's been marked as 88. Yes, I do. Will you recognize that? That was basically my profile. It explains my background and kind of like a resume. It's a resume that has your education and training on it. Yes. Would you make it? When you work a case, a white collar, say, fraud case, do you frequently rely on materials, information, documents that are obtained via a search warrant? Yes. Can you give a little more detail to that, please? Yes, um, federally I use a subpoena, um, but we also will use search warrants. Basically, if I need to obtain bank account information, I will explain why I need the bank account information, and then we will submit a search warrant or a subpoena to the bank. If I need health insurance information, um, I would do a similar process and basically create, recreate that process for potentially any financial information that I needed during the investigation. Okay, and, and basically throughout the years and in terms of your investigations, have you had to utilize search warrants or subpoenas in order to get records in, in an effort to establish how much, say, a person or an entity or persons might have in regards to assets? Yes. How do you do that? It's basically I would look at um, the bank statement, I'd look at the balances in the bank account on a particular date, I would go out, look for properties, and then basically look at what the property values could be based upon an assessor's value, what may be if the house is for sale, what it's being listed at, knowing that a property is going to be ultimately worth what somebody pays. But that gives me at least a basis point. And then for insurance or retirements, I would look at what the balances are in the accounts on a particular date to help me come up with the value. And, and I assume this would include current income as well? Yes. This would include potential uh, retirements as well? Yes. Would you, in addition to tallying up assets in order to figure out how much an entity or a person or persons were worth, figure out liabilities? Yes. Would that be part of the essential, essentially the same equation? Yes. Okay. Now, I assume there's other people like you in this country doing the same thing, certified fraud examiners? 
Yes. And are these types of experts like you, people that rely on those same types of documents to come to conclusions and opinions and things like that? Yes. In this particular case, did you agree to work on the case involving Dan Howard? Yes, I did. Did you, at some point in time, look through various records in an effort to come to a total of their assets back in the early part of 2021? Yes. What types of records did you rely on in order to come to a total or a summary of their assets? I had, um, I was handed a small sheet of paper um, that had been obtained during a search warrant that listed out a number of assets in handwriting with some potential values out to the side of it that helped me begin some things I should be looking at. I obtained bank statements to obtain what the balances were on a set date. I also um, worked with the sheriff's office to obtain um, life insurance policies to see what may be there and retirement accounts um, for both individuals to determine what the balance in those accounts would have been about the particular data I've been asked about. As well as their current incomes? Yes. Okay. And so did you tally up those assets um, in the same fashion that you've done before in the past? Yes. In the same fashion that other experts in your field would do? Yes. And did you create a summary of the Howard's assets back in the early part of 2021? Yes. I'll show you. What number did you say? 56A. 56A. And then you, sir, do you recognize 56A? Yes, I do. What do you recognize that to be? That is basically what I obtained from their bank statements showing deposits going into their bank statements from the employers that I've been informed that they may have worked for, so both this, Kendi and Dan. Okay, so, yeah, so 56A, is that an accurate summary of the income of the Howards back around this time frame that you were speaking of? Yes. Right, and does this summary accurately set out their income uh, four various months back in this time period, 2018 to 2020. Yes. And will this help you with your testimony here today? Yes. Move to admit 56A. Move to 56A is admitted. Move to publish 56A. You may. Very big exhibit, right? Could they not make like a paper? <laughs> Brian says this guy liked way too many videos. He hit that like, <laughs> we're talking about his thumb that seems quite injured, right? You really hit that like button hard, okay? If you haven't yet, just do it gently. <laughs> and then with the court's permission, I think the easiest thing to do is to, be, to step out here. We'll have a pointer for you. That's fine. You can step in the wall there and just do about as you need to. And hopefully this will be close enough for the jury to come to you right here. It's on. Here's the pointer. It's on. And then perhaps... Um, Beginning over here, describing what you have here, and then maybe more people over here to Candy. So basically, I, I created um, the incomes I could see coming in for Dan Hauer and another column for Candy Hauer. Based upon conversations I've had with the detectives working the matter, I've been informed of potential different um, entities that Mr. Hauer or um, Mrs. Um, Hauer would have worked. Um, she was, I was told, a nurse, so I listed basically from the bank statements the deposits that were going into the accounts from could be help to come up with this list um, per the payments, and then down at the bottom I told what for this time period between January of 2018 to January 21, what her total income entering the bank statements I was looking at would have been. And then the other field, or the other columns, were the columns where I was informed that Mr. Howard had been working or would have been receiving the incomes from and total each of those columns um, based upon what I discovered in the bank statements um, during that time period. And so what do you have there at the bottom of that exhibit? Down here was basically kind of an average what um, Ms. Howard's um, average monthly income was, the gross monthly income, and then based upon their tax returns, what they reported um, on their tax returns um, for income. In the time frame for this information? <clears throat> this, it looks like this column may be truncated, but it looks, um, I don't return for 20, um, and the other one says the same, but I'm not sure if it's 20 and 2021 or 
Okay. So in terms of the income coming through in the various amounts, what, what years were those for that you tallied up? Um, it would have been 2018 um, to basically through 2020 with one month in 2021. All right. Thank you. i got to lay the foundation for this next exhibit, so if you don't mind retaking your seat. This is basically a summary of the information I collected identifying the assets that they had and the values associated with those assets. Okay, so these assets would include raw land? Yes. It would include their house? Yes. Um, money in bank accounts? Yes. Okay. Anything else I'm missing? I believe there was um, retirement accounts associated with what they had earned and was sitting in a retirement account that would be um, collected upon retirement. And this is what they were owed to debtor back in around January 2021? Yes. Okay. And would this help with your testimony here today? Yes, it would. 56B? No, 56B is the And I wonder if you could do the same with 56B that you did with the So basically, what I have on the far left side of this column here was basically the assets that had been identified throughout the investigation. Some of the um, information, or some of the assets, were identified off of a handwritten note that had been provided um, that had been obtained through a search warrant. Um, and then here were basically retirement accounts associated with Mr. Howard. <coughs> Um, bank statements um, and what the balances were um, and then some other assets that they had obtained and then Ms. Hen, um, Ms. Howard had a life insurance policy and it summarizes what the life insurance policy um, would have been approximately. And then at the bottom of the sheet if it Oh, did we hear about life insurance? Okay, yeah, there's a true crime checklist in these types of cases. Oh dear. Basically identifies, the top is identifying all the assets that were owned based upon information I had been provided, and in the bottom were the debts that were owned um, at the time, um, the same time period. And so for those of us that are, we learned from hearing better than looking at, about how much in total assets did the Howards have around January 2021? Based on these values, it totals about $2 million um, in assets. Okay, and, and liabilities? The liabilities, it looks like there's eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 that were owed. Okay, and did you learn during the course of your investigation that there was a house in Canyon I purchased um, towards the end of January 2021? Yes. Is that listed there? That is not listed. <laughs> and would have that have been an asset or a liability? if it had just been purchased with a down, small down payment? I believe all that had been paid was the escrow amount. So basically they had agreed into a sales agreement, but it's, from what I understood, it had not um, come to conclusion where all the documents and everything had not been signed yet. So because of that, I did not consider that an active asset. That didn't <coughs> that point in time. Yeah. You can retake your seat if you like, sir. We're gonna put on the Elmo what has already been admitted as 36B. You probably can't see that. If you don't mind leaving your seat again, just for a moment. You mentioned using some documents that were provided by the Sheriff's Department in terms of assessing values for various pieces of property and things like that. Looking at 36B, does that appear to be one of those documents? Yes, it does. And then the next one I have for you is 36C. Essentially the same question for you. Is that one of those documents that you utilized in coming to you values for these Items. All right. Thank you very much. You can take your seat again. Thanks. Shame this guy's boy saw them and now he's also got the sniffles. <laughs> it's not a sniffle free episode. Thank you so much, Donna. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for being here. If you're only joining now, I hope you'll check out the description box if you don't know what's going on or what this case is about. I've got a little write-up there for you. There's also a link to the case playlist, so you can check out part, uh, 
day one, two, and three so far. We're on day four. We are one day behind in our coverage, which is actually really great in this in this trial, so that we don't have to sit through hours of paper flapping <laughs> and long breaks. So the lunch breaks are quite long as well. Sometimes it's like 90 minutes. So yes, okay, I'm, I'm enjoying this format for this one. Shame, look at him. My goodness. <laughs> He's reminding you all to hit that thumbs up. Okay, so let's keep listening to this FBI special agent about the finances. No further questions. Thank you. Customs and Relations. Briefly over. Good morning. Good morning. Now, uh, Special Agent, you're highly experienced in being able to calculate values of different items, right? Yes. Do you know if, it, how many years was it that you've been doing your job? About 18, 19 almost. Okay. And do you know if those documents, whoever filled it out, has that same level of experience? in figuring out values? I do not know. No further question. Any reader? No, thank you. Thank you, sir. You missed that. Would the court consider a lunch 12 minutes early? <laughs> Would the court consider, I like the way that he pitched it, lunch 12 minutes early? <laughs> Judge is like, yeah, sure. So we're going to obviously teleport right through that. Here we go. We'll go ahead and break our lunch hour now rather than start with a witness for 10 minutes. So um, we'll be back. Well, we, we can kind of give me an hour and a half. So I'll be back at 1 20 to start back up. Um, so we'll be back at 1 20 while you're on recess. As always, I'll invite you back to discuss the case among yourselves or anyone else. Or for our opinion. Thank you. Here we go. Look at this guy. The guy looks at the jury. We'll be back at uh, if I can just address one thing, Your Honor. Sure. Um, if after the break, if the, uh, we would request that you remind the jurors not to go through their notebooks, uh, drain other testimony, or anything like that. Are you, are you concerned that that's happening? Yes. Okay. Any Other than it looks like, at least in the second row, all the notebooks are sitting on their chairs. I mean, there's, yes, there's definitely, it's happened. Not a lot, but it has happened. I'm just asking the court to remind okay. it's early instruction. Certainly. All right, we'll be in recess now. As best we can, Did you see that? We just went right through lunch break. <laughs> just skipped an hour and a half of waiting around. Damn, <laughs> I like this format. So here is the next witness, which is witness number 22. Yes, witness number 22. Okay, here we go. We are one hour 35 into our trial footage for the day, and it's three hours and 51. The original footage is seven hours 44. Saving you time. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's go. Okay. Thank you. You may depart. Could you please state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Sure, Kristen Angela Miller, Miller, and my last name is M I L L E R. How are you employed? Currently I'm self employed. Do you um, have a particular profession? Yes, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner. Within um, that profession, um, do you have a day job? Yes. What's your day job? I go around the state of Washington and try to help with the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill in. in Washington. Do you also have a, lack of a better phrase, side hustle? Yes. Can you describe that? For sure. Um, my side job is uh, real weight loss. That was another business that um, I opened, and um, that has been a part-time business that I've had for many years now. I um, developed it after researching a national brand, or um, there's a program that is across the nation that works like that. And so um, I developed it after a client kind of, or a colleague had actually kind of asked about it. So I started inquiring. So anyway, um, and I did that to pay off my student loans. 
Let me ask you a couple follow-up questions. Do you remember approximately what year you started that company? I would guess 2017, 2016, 17. And in your time in running that company, were you the primary nurse involved in that, or did you also bring on other practitioners? I was primary. We do. We did have uh, two other nurse practitioners throughout the time. Not the whole time. Um, the, the first nurse practitioner that we hired to assist would have been in probably a couple years ago. I apologize. I'm not really great with the timeline. Sure, that's okay. So it's fair to say it's mostly been you. Yes. Okay. And is this a is this a big business for you? Do you keep a lot of clients? No. Um, at any point in time, kind of what's like the smallest number of clients you've had on hand versus kind of what's kind of the largest number? Um, probably smallest, uh, you know, I don't know, it could be, shoot, it could be five to ten. <laughs> I mean, and the largest, um, maybe a hundred. Okay. Has it been different sizes at different times? Yes. points in time within that timeline you described? Yes. Okay. You, you previously stated that you designed this off of a, a national company, is that correct? Correct. correct. And in doing so, um, did you kind of tailor that to your own business needs? Yes. Um, did you utilize your own medical background in sort of feeling comfortable with this business model that you adopted? Absolutely. Can you describe how the program is basically structured. Um, sure. So it's structured for folks that um, have compulsive overeating disorder or binge eating disorder, and um, they go through a series of questions. We rule out um, if they have any, if there's another cause. So, which is typical, if you're going to treat somebody, then you want to rule out the other possible reasons of what it could be. Um, and once those are ruled out, then they, based on what uh, the program is meant to do is to help people um, create their own happiness. And, and so there's certain guidelines that they have to have, but um, they could kind of, we would work together. Either it's one month, uh, two month, or three month. And then there was a six month uh, program that we set up for folks that were needing a longer term. Would you say that you had sort of a target demographic? Yes. And who would that be? Um, folks that, are having trouble losing weight and have compulsive overeating. And would that be mostly women? Yes. Um, if you, in the initial screening, determined that there was some other source or cause for their overeating or their weight, um, would you have kept that person or would you refer them on? No, I would have referred them on. It would have been, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Particularly, I want to talk to you about your business in the late 2018, 2019, 2020 time frame. Okay. Um, as you may recall, there was a pandemic going on kind of in that period of time. I do. Did that have an effect on your business? Very much. Can you describe how that changed your business structure? Um, sure. I would meet with my clients face-to-face uh, -face in my office and prior to the pandemic, and then it had to go to telehealth for quite a while. And so when it came to both sort of intakes and um, follow-up meetings, was that typically done in person during that period of time or was it done through some sort of platform? Through some sort of platform. You described that the program was tailored at different lengths. Correct. Um, was that something that you would work out during initial intake? We, it would be an on. I like to work with my clients uh, quite a bit. So, and it would be something that we would work together. The goal is uh, to, to start the medication, and you take it until you get to your goal, weight. and then you go off of it. So, we would kind of collaborate. But it was mostly the intake. And then, if someone say went off of your program and gained weight back, could they come back to you? Yes. Was that common? Yes. Within your program, um, were there particular drugs that you prescribed? Yes. What drugs were those? Fentanyl was a primary medication that we used uh, for the weight loss. Prozac, in addition to the fentanyl, it helps um, sustain the, the length of the fentanyl in the body. And uh, Topamax, if they needed it. Uh, the Prozac and the Topamax were if they needed it. 
um, in addition to the fentanyl. And um, were the, the what, what was the primary drug of the program? Fentanyl. And dosage-wise, would that have been the drug that they received the largest amount of? Oh, yes. Um, what about the Prozac and the, the Topamax? Uh, Prozac was the smallest possible dose that you could ever get. <laughs> um, and the Topamax is the same, just a very tiny dose. When you were doing either intakes with your clients or um, in follow-up appointments, were there any screenings that you did with those individuals? So yes, we went through a series of questions and um, with my background, of course, I was very cautious about wanting to make sure um, that I was a safe method and how to help support clientele. So um, asking a series of questions and kind of ruling out uh, any possible bipolar disorder, mood disorder, depression because those things um, would be con contraindicated um, with the program. So. so you were not looking to treat people that might have those kinds of um, mood disorders or other psychiatric issues? No, no, I'm really lost. Um, is your program designed to treat mood disorders or psychiatric issues? Not really lost. Um, do you prescribe Prozac Topamax or, or any other mood altering drugs for major depression within real weight loss? No. Did you have a client by the name of Kendi Howard? I did. Um, was Kendi Howard a, a constant client for you or one of those that you saw once or did she come back more than once? She came back more than once, pretty typical. And was that due to that kind of lose and gain pattern you previously described? Yeah. It's... During the times that Kendi Howard was your client, um, did you prescribe her the drugs that you just described? Yes. When she would come back, um, did the prescriptions change? And that sort of depends. Again, I work with my clients. Um, it, it would depend on the situation and what they're having trouble with. So if I could explain just briefly. Okay, so the fentanyl is the main medication. That's the one that they take. And then if they, so how, what the fentanyl does is it, it, it slows down the excretion of, I mean, sorry, the Prozac does, it slows down the excretion of the fentanyl. But many people like to drink coffee. Um, some like to smoke. That increases the rate of the excretion of the fentanyl. So the Prozac actually slows that down. That's the only purpose of the Prozac. So um, if they really weren't having a hard time, how they would know is it was the medication would stop working too soon. And then usually it would be their patterns as a compulsive overeating before, right before bedtime, evening time, and then that wasn't quite successful. So if you added the Prozac, then they could, then it would just kind of prolong it throughout the day, right before uh, they could at least ensure their sleep. So it was, it, it was really, if they needed it, and I, I would work with folks as far as like, um, you know, yeah, you don't have to take it, but if you need it, it's there. And then the Topamax was really meant more for uh, cravings. If people had like some significant like, sugar cravings, or you know, if it was on, to on top of, if they were still having troubles, because um, it's always, I mean, <laughs> our society, I don't know if I need to say more. <laughs> sure. <Okay. laughs> So each time that Kendi Howard would come back, would she have that same screening for potential mood disorders? So she wouldn't have the same screening. Um, it would be basically when I do an intake, we develop a trusting working relationship, and I wouldn't go through all the same screening. They do a uh, full palette, like, or, you know, panel, whatever you want to say, pretty much um, you know, once a year. But with the follow-ups, those are a little bit... Um, you know, how's it going? What, you know, how, what, what do you need? Are you sleeping? Are you, you know, eating? Are you, you know, at least eating? Are you, you know, those are kind of the big things you tolerate in medication, that kind of thing. Permission to approach the witness? Ms. Miller, um, we've been talking about Prozac and Topamax. Does Prozac have a generic name? Fluoxetine. And does Topamax have a generic name? Topiramine. And is Fentramine the generic or the brand name? Generic. 
Is it, does it have a brand name? Adipex. I'm going to show you some pictures. These are 45A, 45B, 45C, 45D, 45E, 45F, and 45G. Have you ever seen what's depicted in these pictures before? No. Is there anything in these pictures that you do recognize? Sure. Okay. Um, do you recognize, um, let me assist. do you see your name in any of these pictures? Yes. Okay. And is that present in each of these? And I'm happy to slow down if that's... Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, yep. Yes. 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 Ms. Miller, were you treating Kenny Howard for major depression? No. Were you treating her for any mood disorders? No. If she had major depression or a mood disorder, would it have been inappropriate for her to be in the program? Yes. No further questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So you seem passionate about helping um, mental illness. Is that right? Correct. And, and you said over in Washington, or does that mean like the institutionalization, such as at Eastern State Hospital? Correct. And. Uh, you describe yourself as a, a psychiatric nurse practitioner? Yes. And uh, you would agree that often when a person has an illness of one sort, they can often have a, a secondary illness as well? Objection, relevance, beyond the scope. Response? It's not beyond the scope. She talked about her practice and what she treats you. I'll rephrase. Okay. Sustained. The... Ms. Howard came to you um, because you said you treat binge eating disorders? Correct. And were you treating her for binge eating disorder? No. But you did prescribe the medications you listed earlier to her, correct? Correct. And those included Prozac? Correct. No further questions. Can you read her? Ms. Miller. And Jason is like, boom, mic drop. There you go. I thought he was actually going to ask if Prozac couldn't cause depression because that's some of the stigma of it, right? That would have been <laughs> a more meaningful defense line of question, but maybe he can't do that. I don't know. But uh, okay, now there's a little bit of redirect. You treat two kinds of disorders, correct? Correct. Binge eating disorder and compulsive eating disorder. Correct. What is binge eating? Binge eating disorder is um, where it's more uh, just at, uh, they have certain times, it's not as consistent. Um, I would still treat that. However, the compulsive overeating is something as if the compulsion is more like an obsessive compulsive. So I will lift the trigger bunny for this because maybe some of these topics are triggering for some with binge eating disorder or eating disorders in general or depression or Prozac or anything like that. So. Just know that's what they're discussing now. And you are in a safe place here with us. Sort of thing. So it just matters um, in the behavior of the eating patterns. So some folks would, you know, not eat all day. They might eat a huge meal. Um, and then some would be just, I can't, if I start eating, I can't stop. It's kind of a compulsive thing. Were you treating Kenny Howard for compulsive overeating? Correct. Yes. No further questions. Thank you, ma'am. You may be Okay, thank you. Thank you, Judge. Sir, can you say your whole name and spell both your first and last names? My name is Derek Hollenbeck, D-E-R-R-I-C-K-H-O-L-L-E-N-B-E-C-K. -E -E How are you employed? I am employed by the Kimby County Sheriff's Office. How long have you worked there? Since 2008. And what do you do now? I am a sex crimes detective with Special Victims Unit. How long have you been with the Detectives Division at the Sheriff's Department? Since about 2016. 
And part of your duties help executing search warrants for various crimes? Yes, sir. On February 17th of 2021, did you act, execute a search warrant or help execute a search warrant up in Athol, Idaho? Yes, sir. And for which residence was that? For the Dan Howard residence. Can you tell us what the focus of your part in the search warrant was? My part was taking photographs of the outside shop and the two vehicles that were on scene. Okay. In terms of the shop, did you end up taking a photograph of a gun safe? Yes, sir. Where was that gun safe in relationship to the shop? It was inside the shop in the center of the shop. And did you take that photograph of the door with the gun safe open? Yes, sir. I'm going to show that to you as soon as I find it. But um, did your search also um, extend to a vehicle? Yes, sir. What kind of vehicle? Uh, it was two. One was a Dodge pickup truck, and the other one was an Equinox. And SUV. was one vehicle associated with one person in the marriage? Yes, sir. Which was which? Uh, the red Equinox was had uh, Kendi's ID in it. And how about the pickup? The pickup had Dan Howard's wallet in it. In terms of the search of Kendi's car, did you locate a number of items? Yes, sir. Can you generally describe those for us? Uh, in the center console, I found uh, a couple of receipts from Super One and one bank receipt and a Maurice's receipt. Throughout the rest of the car? What did you find throughout the rest of the car? The rest of the car had one bag in it um, and then a whole bunch of empty boxes in the back of it. Did you locate anything else that you took from the car that you brought with you today uh, inside the car? Just the receipts, sir. Okay. Could you go ahead and pull those out for me? I think you've, we've labeled them as 68. Okay, sir. What is 68? 68 is a binder where I put all the receipts into it. And are the receipts uh, within that binder the same receipts you took out of Candy's car on the 17th of February 2021? Yes, sir. And are they relatively close in time to this incident? Yes, sir. Are they in the same or substantially same condition now as they were when you took them from Candy's car? Yes, sir. And it's me, me to get uh, 68. Okay. You have in your hands a photograph of a safe with some firearms in it. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Do you recognize that to be? It is a photograph I took of the contents of the safe. Okay. And for the record, that is exhibit number 67A. Does that reflect what you could see when you executed that search warrant on the 17th of February? Yes, sir. Move to admit 67A. Any objection? 67A is admitted. So, I take it you did not participate in the execution of the search warrant on February 3rd of 2021 at the Howard residence. Is that accurate? That is correct, sir. Nonetheless, in terms of the various detectives who did participate in that search, you're, are, you're still employed at the Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. And some of those detectives are no longer employed there. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you bring some things with you today that were booked into evidence following execution of the February 3rd, 2021 search warrant? Yes, sir. Um, and it, have those been in the custody of the Sheriff's Department since they were booked in by those respective deputies back in early February of 2021? Yes, sir. And have they been in your sole custody and control since you retrieved them from evidence today and brought them to court? Yes, sir. Let's work our way through the rest of the things that you have in that box you brought with you. Um, let's start with what we've labeled as 69A and B. Yes, camera person, we want to see the box. <laughs> it just looks so cool. It's just like digging to the side, like quickly digging the box. What do we have now? What do we have now? Okay, now we can see it. Go ahead and take 69A and B out. It's going to be the Glock and the bolts associated with the Glock. If you could put that on that counter in front of you.
Yeah, we just want we just want the block for now. We're going to hit the Taurus secondly. So 69A and then 69B, which are going to be the block. Let's go and dig in the box again. Miss Holmes, I also wonder, I have not heard of Daniel Howard in any other relationship yet. You know, not before Kendi, not after Kendi, so I'm not sure. But I was wondering as well, you know, did he ever have another lady in his life or no? Oops. the same condition now as it was since it was booked into evidence by Coopan County Sheriff's deputies. Yes, sir. All right, let's turn our attention then, if you will, to 70 A and B. Can I? Do you recognize 70 A? Yes, sir. What's that? It is the Taurus. And has that Taurus been rendered safe? Yes, sir. How so? It has a zip tie through it, okay. to the barrel. So again, you can't fire that unless you cut the, the zip tie and load it up. Yes, sir. And then 60, or excuse me, 70B would be the bolts associated with that firearm? Yes, sir. Are those two items in the same or substantially same condition now as they were when they were booked into evidence? Yes, sir. If you could turn your attention to, you can put that stuff off to the side if you have any room. 71. What's 71? 71 is the divorce custody intake sheet. Those. And that's been placed into a binder? Yes, sir. Inside 71, are there various sheets that pertain to partially filled out divorce paperwork? Yes, sir. That was on the downstairs bar when it was seized following execution of search warrant on February so. 3rd, 2021? Yes, sir. And do those documents appear to be in the same or substantially same condition now as they were when they were booked into evidence? Yes, sir. As far as you can tell? Yes, sir. Okay, and the last thing I think you brought um, with you has been labeled 72. And the 72 is a plastic baggie with a paper baggie inside and uh, another plastic baggie. Do you recognize 72? Yes, sir. You... I love it when they call it a baggie. Plastic baggie with another paper baggie. You see that plastic baggie? You got your baggie, sir? Yes, yes, sir. I got the baggie. You recognize 72. B. It is the glass shards. That were found in the bedroom upstairs in the Howard house? I, what I believe, sir, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I assume he's just setting foundation, so. Foundation, foundation for response inside that house, right? The objection was leading and foundation. You can approach. You can approach. <clears throat> yes, sir. And has it been in your sole custody control since then? Yes, sir. Okay, so those items that we've just talked about, um, we're going to leave them with the clerk. I'm not going to move to admit them at this time, okay? Yes, sir. What else you got left in that box? Anything else? Just the P1FCU document, sir. Okay. After execution of this search warrant on the 17th, were you still involved in the investigation? Yes, sir. Did you, through the course of the upcoming weeks execute search warrants on various in other entities? Yes, sir. Like what? I did one on P1 MCU Bank, uh, Bank of America, Navy Federal Credit Union, and Owsley. Uh, I don't know the whole name, but... Plastic surgery? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have any other questions for you. Let me go ahead and remove those items and put them in our box and work. I do wonder if they're going to clarify, you know, what the glass was from. Because when they showed pictures of the bedroom, Kendi's bedroom, which I think was next to the bathroom, there was there were little glass shards on the carpet. But we don't know what that's from. You know, wouldn't that be signs of a struggle or something happening there? Why is there, why is there glass there? That doesn't match the scene at all. So, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you said that on the 17th is when you uh, went and did a search of the garage or the shop? Yes, sir. And that is um, at the same time you searched the vehicles? Yes, sir. And you found Kendi's ID mm -hmm. in her vehicle? Yes, sir. And Dan's wallet in his in his truck. Yes, sir. Open the question. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Judge. Can you say your whole name and spell your last name? Sure. My name is Gary Lawrence Tolleson. T. Gary Tolleson. We've got a pause. <laughs> Introducing our next witness here. Okay. Gary Tolleson, detective witness number 24. And yes, it does appear that, they, you know, they're flying through the witnesses. But just remember, I did cut out all the fluff. Okay. So it's feeling like here they go, which is, isn't, isn't it nice to watch trials like this? I really like it. So we're two hours and three minutes into our footage of three hours and 51. So I see many of you are here the whole trial day as we watch it with me. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. O-L-L-E-S-O-N. How are you employed? Uh, by the state of Idaho as a detective. Can you run us through your law enforcement career, please? Okay. <clears throat> I have been a police officer for 47 plus years. I started out as an Orange County Deputy Sheriff in Orange County, California. Worked in the jail, went to the academy. Uh, post academy, I graduated from that, and then they threw me back in the jail, and I didn't like that, so I quit and joined the Oakland Police Department. The Oakland Police Department then put me through the Oakland Police Department post academy. Uh, I passed that, and then I worked in Oakland for 31 and a half years. I have worked as a beat cop, a traffic cop, uh, been on the SWAT team for 21 years. I then made sergeant of police, went to criminal investigation division. I have worked in forgery, robbery, burglary, theft sections, weapons unit, then the special operations section. I retired and joined the Idaho State Police. I've been with the Idaho State Police for over 16 years. I have worked for Post in Idaho. Didn't like that, so I moved over to detectives, and so I have been a detective for 14 years for the Idaho State Police. And what sorts of things do you investigate these <laughs> I love hearing the summary, the bullet points of his career. Did that, didn't like it, moved on to there, didn't like that. So then I moved on. <laughs> Detective, okay. I am a major crime investigator, so we do death investigations, homicides, uh, major fraud. We do political crimes. I have investigated crimes against the governor, state senators, uh, state assemblymen. I have investigated child deaths, child neglect. Uh, we do officer-involved shootings and then anything else were assigned. You mentioned a post instructor. Did you do that in California as well as in Idaho? Yes. Can you describe essentially what that means? In California, I was, oh, had, you have to go to a, a post instructor course, graduate from that, and then we teach in the basic academy. Uh, in the basic academy, I taught uh, eight of the core subjects for the state of California. When I came to Idaho, because I had the experience in California, I was hired for, Cal I'm sorry, for post uh, from up for Idaho and was then teaching instructors to teach police instructors. So I have taught police officers, command officers, and uh, in-service training for 24 years. Okay, and that would be in both states? That's correct. Back in the late 80s, did you know, California train police officers in the carotid neck restraint? Yes. What's that? The carotid restraint is a technique in self-defense where I would cut off the oxygenated blood to your brain, make you go unconscious so that I could control you. What, what sort of training did you have as a police Very important, very important witness describing that carotid restraint defense that the defendant allegedly used on Kendi. This officer in that type of a hold. Uh, it is taught in all the academies that I've been in, so I have probably been taught 40 or 50 hours of that. Yeah. As a police officer in California, have you utilized that hold before? Oh, yes. And it's about how many times? Um, I have probably used it a dozen times. Okay. I've got a couple of diagrams that I'd like to show you. Actually, one of the diagram into the floor, guys. May I approach? No. 53A through 53C. So take a look at 53A. Do you recognize it? Yes. What's that? This is a demonstration on the left side of the tiger or chantuary uh, carotid restraint, and on the right side it shows a chokehold. A carotid chokehold? Yes. And then 53B. 
That is a demonstration of the carotid restraint as I was trained. And then the last one, 53C. That appears to be two men wrestling. It could be judo or jujitsu. And one man is applying another chancery or what it used to be called a tiger control yeah. chokehold. And the difference between that and a carotid neck restraint is what? He's got his hand wrapped around behind the head and he's holding his, uh, he's applying pressure with his right bicep. Would these three exhibits help you with your testimony here? Today? Yes. Move to admit 53A. A very experienced witness. I want to say 47 years, Vicky was saying, I think, of experience. And Forensic Furious said he's one of the lead ISP investigators in the Idaho 4 case as well. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so we're going to look at 53A first of all. Describe what's going on on the left and then the right. On the left, you can, obviously you can see that the right arm his, is around the neck. There's a V. His elbow is pointed towards the sternum of the, of the subject. His left hand, or his weak hand, is wrapped around the backside of the uh, subject's head. On the right, you can't see it as well, but his right hand should be attached to his bicep. What, what's the difference between the two holds? First of all, in terms of naming them. Well, this is a carotid restraint as I was taught. The second on the left, the one that on closest to me. Okay. And then on the far right, away from me, is more of a choke hold, but it is a partial carotid restraint because you can see where his elbow is out of alignment, but his forearm is across the neck. What's your your understanding based on your training and experience in the effects of either one of those? This is the proper technique closest to me. What's going to happen is obviously your brain needs a lot of oxygen, and you. It's close, your heart's closest to your head, so it can oxygenate the blood, pump it up to the head. You, if you start to slow that flow of blood, or you cut it off, your brain's not going to get oxygen. The first thing you're going to do is go unconscious. If you, on the far one, what I'm going to call is a chokehold, if I cut off your wind, I could kill you very quickly because you cannot breathe. But I don't want to do that. What I want to do is control you so I'm going to cut off the oxygen to your brain and see if you go unconscious. If you go into conscious, then I can control you. Let's look at the next one. It's 53B. And what are we looking at there? To me, this is two instructors. Obviously, one of them is still conscious because he has his hands up on uh, the applied carotid restraint. The officer has kneeled down behind the subject and brought him to the ground, which is taught you don't want somebody to go unconscious that's larger than you standing up. As you both fall down, you may break their neck, those kind of things. He's kneeling and supporting the back with his other leg. He has his hands and he's gripping his hands. The reason being, you're applying with your forearm and your bicep to both sides of the neck. You are not squeezing the throat. So this allows him to control that. He has his head up against the subject's head, not for control, but to protect his eyes, to keep someone from coming back and poking or clawing at your eyes. And so that picture there, 53B, would be the way you were trained to apply the carotid uh, hold? Yes, the carotid restraint, is. this is how I was taught. And that would be the correct way to do it? Yes, it looks like it's being applied correctly. Based on your training experience, um, how long would you need to hold a person in that position in order to render them unconscious? Very short, uh, five, maybe ten seconds, depending on how big someone is, how much struggling you're doing, their physical capabilities, if they have a bad heart or the blood is not pumping well, it, they may go unconscious very quickly. All right, and then the last one we have is 53C. Can you describe what we're looking at there, please? Five to ten seconds, oh my goodness. Sure, okay. Yes, this, this could be judo, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian uh, judo. Um, the reason I say that is because they're grappling, they're on the ground, and both of them are on the ground. He has his hand across his throat. He's applying with his opposite hand. You see his left arm is grabbing his right bicep. He also is interlocking his legs on him. And this is taught in judo and jiu-jitsu. Is this a proper carotid neck restraint? No, it looks more like it's across his throat versus a carotid restraint. Okay. And this is what you were taught not to do? 
in police, yes. Right. And so let me run back again one more time. To <laughs> He's like, in police, yes. Maybe in jujitsu. Otherwise. Yeah, um, he's mentioned twice now, to control you. So, you know, it seems like perhaps the defendant would have done something like that to to make the victim unconscious, to put her in the bath, and then do the rest, right? But they did say that she died from asphyxiation, so... Sure. 53A, you've got the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the left, that particular hole, chronic restraint is what you were taught to do? Yes. And other police officers back in the late 80s in California? Yes. And this, the ones to the right, that particular hold was an incorrect hold. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. When you went from California to Idaho, um, was California still training in that the carotid hold? Yes. Was Idaho? Uh, yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was Idaho training that in post? It was on and off, but yes. Uh, when I first got here, it was. Then it went away. When did it go away? I don't know the exact date. I wasn't working for post at that time. Do you police officers today in California get taught that hold? The foundation for his knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Do you keep abreast of various uh, agencies and what they teach? I have in the past, yes. Has well, there been a lapse in that? I currently went back to it looking at them again. What's that? I said I have looked at them again. Yes, I have gone back to looking at them again. Okay, is that because you've worked for both California and Idaho in terms of being a police officer? Yes, my interest in that, yes. Is that because you've uh, trained police officers in California and Idaho? Yes. Is that because you can't put the career of being a police officer behind you? I would say that would be true. Are you familiar with whether or not California still trains officers in the crime too? They have uh, stopped uh, since the Floyd incident. What about Idaho? Idaho does not teach it in the basic academy, but it's my understanding that still in Southern Cal I'm sorry, Southern Idaho agencies are still using it. What's deadly force in Idaho? What deadly force? What is deadly force in Idaho? It's the force that I have to use, or I can use, against someone who's using deadly force against me, or force that may cause permanent bodily injury. Is the crowd of chokehold considered deadly force in Idaho? By uh, the Idaho State Police, yes. You know Dan Howard? I do. Is he here today? Is he here today? Yes, this is gentleman sitting right here. Seated next to his attorney dressed in blue? Yes. How have you known him? Uh, we both worked on the Idaho State Police when I uh, first came here. Which was what year? 2007. Right. So you've known him for several years? Yes. In getting ready for this case, did you take a look at his records as a police officer at some point? His post records, yes. Okay. And it, would that include his post records in California as well as Idaho? Yes. Can you tell us, based upon your reference to his records, whether or not Dan Howard was trained in the use of chronic chokehold in California? Yes, I believe the academy he attended, they did. He did receive that training? Yes. Part of what you learned in terms of applying the karate chokehold um, pertain to what happens if you keep persisting with the hold after someone is rendered unconscious. For, if we're talking about the karate restraint, the answer is yes. Uh, we were taught, or I was taught, not to apply it more than 15 seconds. It could cause permanent brain damage or death. No further questions. <laughs> Thank you. Cross examination. Thank you. Dr. Detective. So, may, may I first put our retreat?
you stated, Detective, that you have taught uh, the clouded restraint to other individuals? No. Okay. But you've been in classes that involve it? Yes. And this is a classroom setting? It appears to be, yes. Okay. Um, in that classroom setting, are participants told to fight back? I don't know what they were told in this picture. Now, this classroom setting, in this is 53A, is a lot different than the setting in 53C of uh, wrestling, correct? Yes. Okay. And it is a violent maneuver, correct? Which maneuver? The karate machine. I would say that violence is, yes. And uh, you said you had to uh, apply it a half dozen or a dozen times in your career? I would say that I have applied the karate restraint about a dozen times. When you apply the karate restraint, uh, would those individuals uh, fight back? The answer is yes. And you mentioned earlier about on Exhibit 53B, the one here on the uh, on this side, that is a proper way to do choke uh, or apply restraint, correct? That is one of the ways to apply it. Yes. You're trained not to do it the other way, and you don't want to cause permanent damage to any uh, parts of the neck or anything else, correct? Are you referring to the picture on the right? Yes. Yes, I would say that that is incorrect. Okay. It's an incorrect application of the carotid restraint. I would say that that was a chokehold on the right, a okay. carotid restraint on the left. Okay, correct. And um, you're trained to do a carotid restraint, not a chokehold. That's correct. A chokehold can cause permanent damage. Yes, you could crush the larynx, they could swell up, they could choke to death. Yes. Okay. And uh, you mentioned earlier that in how you um, control it, Often people's hands are going back? Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Motion to report the court. You may. Like the defense's line of questioning did not prove anything, did it? I don't know what the point of that was. Next witness for the state. Brooke Wilkins. Okay, so Brooke Wilkins is Candy's daughter. And it's Candy's daughter from a previous relationship, so Dan is not her dad. And we heard on the first day that as soon as Brooke had found out that her mother had died, she immediately accused Dan Howard, saying, you killed my mom. And remember that um, Detective Lalit, Lalatin, Lalatin, there you go. <laughs> he was saying that Dan looked visibly upset and he just like, you know, couldn't believe like she's accusing him. Oh yeah, she saw right through him, in my opinion. So, here is, this must be so hard as well, you know. Shame, man. To be her daughter and be here on the stand takes a lot of courage. So, let's have a listen. Good afternoon, ma'am. step forward. Please raise your hand and Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, ma'am. Feel free to have a seat on the stand. Yes, as best you can, please speak in the room. Okay. Thank you. You may have a card. Please state your full name and spell your last for the record. Brooke Kendall Wilkins, W-I-L-K-I-N-S. Brooke, who was your mother? Kendi. Kendi's last name? Howard. Is she your biological mother? Yes. Do you know your mother's state of birth? 4 1972 What was your biological father's name? Jim Forsman. Did Jim Forsman raise you? He had me on the weekends. I would say that 
predominantly through my childhood, Dan Howard raised me. How did Dan Howard come into your life? Um, they were married the month before I turned two. And they would be? Uh, Kendi and Dan. Do you know what year that would have been based on your? 1994. Do you see the person that you know to be Dan Howard in the courtroom today? I do. Where do you see him? He is next to his defense attorneys wearing a blue jacket and a white shirt. It must be hard to look at him. Um, Brooke said on Facebook four days ago, the jury trial for the state of Idaho versus Dan Howard regarding him being charged with murder one and domestic battery of Kendi Howard begins today. Today will most likely just be jury selection. The trial is expected to last three weeks. Um, jury deliberation could take hours to days. News outlets have been allowed access. At this time, I'm unsure who will be there. I do not know if an organization will be live streaming. I'm beyond grateful that the court is allowing me to be my mom's victim advocate. This allows me to be able to sit in on the trial. So she's probably been there, you know, every day. She said, I appreciate everyone's kind words. The last few weeks have been very chaotic. I'm sorry for my slow replies. I'm hopeful today. I know the positive goodness that radiated from her will not be suppressed. What we've been waiting uh, for over three years for is here. Shame. Okay. Do you know how long your mom and Dan dated before they got married? I'm, a, I'm not for sure. I'm assuming around a year. After they married in 1994, um, let me ask it this way. Where were they living in 1994? Canada. At some point, did they move? Yes, we moved to Lewiston. Do you recall approximately what year you moved to Lewiston? 98, 99. That, you know, kind of like I was about five. And then did something major happen in your family while you were living in Lewiston? Uh, my brother was born. What's your brother's name? Wyatt Howard. Do you know what year he was born? 96, 97. And would Wyatt have been the biological child of your mother, Kendi, and Dan Howard? Yes. At some point after that, did your family move again? Yes, we moved to Powell, Idaho. And then at some point after that, did your family move again? Yes, we moved to Athol, Idaho. And when you moved to Athol, Idaho, <coughs> did you move to a particular address? 30267 North Wheat Ridge Road. And what year approximately or what age were you when you moved to Athol? I was 11, I want to say, so that would put 2003. And so your brother, Wyatt, would have been approximately how many years younger than you? It's about four to five years, four and a half years younger than me. So he would have been, I think, six. So, at that point, was it the four of you living in that house on Wheat Ridge? Yes. And can you just kind of briefly describe that property? Um, it's on 10 acres, uh, where the first house um, off of, on that road, where the first house, uh, it's a four bedroom, three bath. Uh, we had a shop. We had multiple outpost buildings for farm animals. Did you reside in that house for a number of years? Yes. Approximately how old were you when you moved out? Uh, I moved out when I was 19. You know what year that was? 2011. And then did you live outside of the home for a while? I did. Did you at a later point move back into that house on the bridge? I did. What year was that approximately? 2015. Okay. Was there a reason that you moved back home? Uh, yes, my rent was being um, raised and I had a daughter, so to get her in a school system for a, set, a good a set amount of time, I moved back home. How old is your daughter now? My daughter's 11. How old was she when you moved into the house on Weaver? She was three. Christian, to approach Madam Clark and retrieve some exhibits. You may.
shame. She looks uncomfortable sitting there with Jan Howard sitting probably right in front of her. I did. How many years did you reside there? About f five years. I moved out in 2020. Okay. So five years plus another eight years before that with a little bit of a break in between? Yes. Okay. So a lot of years that you lived in that house? Yes. When you lived in that house, did particular people have particular bedrooms? Yes. I'm going to show you some diagrams that have been previously entered into evidence as states 2A and 2B. I'm going to start with 2A. Brooke, you can step out if you need to be able to see that a little bit better. Okay. So, I'm right, sitting right next to you, Brooke, there's a pointer. Oh, okay. There's a green button that you can, yeah, there you go. Okay, so if you see a room on there noted as master bedroom. Yes. Who lived, who lived, who slept in that bedroom? That was Dan in my mom's bedroom. Okay. Um, there's a bathroom off of the master. Who used that bathroom? That's Dan's bathroom. Did your mother use that bathroom? Occasionally when I was younger growing up, she would take showers and stuff in that bathroom. As I got older, and especially after I moved out the first time, then she could only use that middle bathroom right there. Um, in your many years of living in this home, um, did you become accustomed with your mother's bathing habits? Yes. Um, can you briefly describe what her habits were? So every morning she took a shower, wash her hair, wash her body. Um, every night to relax, she took a bubble bath. So always had some kind of bubble or um, bath oils and whatnot. She always put her hair in a claw clip. Um, her, the bath was not to be cleaning, essentially, just a relaxation type thing. And when she would take that nightly bubble bath, was it always in that middle bathroom? As I was an adult, yes. Okay. There's two other bedrooms on that, on the other side of that bathroom. Yes. You see those? Yep. Whose bedrooms were those? When I was growing up or as an adult. Sounds like it changed? Yes. Okay, let's talk about when you were, when you moved back in as an adult. When I moved back in, uh, this room right here was like uh, my daughter's playroom, and this would have been her bedroom. Okay. Now, in this picture, Brooke, um, we see some stairs up and stairs down. Um, and then there's another diagram that I'll show you here in a second. Is your house a three-leveled house? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Are two of the levels on top of each other? Yes. Can you describe how that layout works? Yeah, so you walk in through this garage. Here's this main floor. You go up, that's the upstairs. You'll go down to the downstairs, and this upper level rests exactly on top of this. Bottom. Okay. So the master bedroom, Dan's bathroom and, and Kendi's bathroom, would be directly above the lower level. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So there is not a level in between. Correct, just one floor. Okay. Turning to to B. Is this the lower level? Yes. Which part of this is underneath the master bedroom? This area right here is going to be under the master bedroom. And is that bath that's connected directly under Kenny's bath? Yes. Okay. And then there's also another bedroom down there. Yes. Laundry room as well? Yep. That would be under the uh, upstairs bedrooms that we previously saw? Correct. Okay. 
Would you say I going to accurately depict your house as you knew it? Yes. You can say that. When you were living there as an adult, were things, um, were you able to observe who did what around the house? Yes. And was that because you were living there, staying there pretty much every night? Yes. You had lots of opportunities to view the other individuals in the house? Yes. During the period of time that you were living there as an adult, who else was living there? So myself, my daughter, my mom, and Dan. For a very faint period of time, my brother Wyatt lived there as well. Do you remember approximately what year Wyatt was living there? A couple months in 2019 is my best guess. Within the house, um, did were there certain areas of the house that Kendi liked to spend time and hang out in? Yes. Can you describe that? So the living room she would typically use is on the main floor. That's where she would um, watch TV. Then the bathroom, that main bathroom that she would use. Um, the laundry room, she would be down in there. If um, me and my daughter were home, you know, she would, we could be up in my daughter's playroom. What about Dan? Were there particular areas of the house that Dan spent time in? Yes, Dan typically, if he was watching TV, he went into that lower level uh, living room in the basement. You mentioned that there's a shop and some outbuildings on the property as well. Yes. Did your mom spend a lot of time out there? Not so much. When I was younger and we had farm animals, she would go out and take care of the farm animals, but um, as an adult, we didn't have those, no. What about the shop? No. Who typically spent time in the shop? Dan spent lots of time in the shop. What kinds of things were in the shop? Uh, there was a boat, a camper, tools, a gun safe, a workout area in the back. Was that a workout area utilized by your mom or by Dan? By Dan. Um, were the um, items that were out in the shop, were those Dan's items or your mom's items? Uh, Judge, I'm not asking it in a legal conclusion sense. Primarily all the items were dance. Um, there were some Christmas decorations and such in the very back that would consider like family items. Did your mom go out to the shop very often? No. You mentioned that there was a gun safe out in the shop. Is that yes. Correct? To your knowledge, was that gun safe locked or kept locked? It was locked. Do you, you know where that key was kept? I do not. Do you know who had access to that key? Dan. Do you know if your mom had a key to that safe? My mom did not have a key to the safe. Do you know if your mom um, had been given a gun by Dan? My mom was given a gun by Dan for Christmas one year. Were you present when Dan gave your mom a gun? Yes. Do you recall approximately how many Christmases before her death that occurred? Roughly five years, it had been some time. In the five years after, well, let me, let me back up. You, you observed the exchange between Dan and your mom of this particular present. Yes. Okay, can you describe what you observed? My mom got a Christmas present that was not normal, so she opened the gift. She realized it was a gun and she was immediately unhappy. In the five years um, between your mom receiving that gun at Christmas um, and her death, did you know her to shoot that gun? No. Did you ever see her shoot that gun? No. Do you know if that gun was kept in the house? For a short period of time after it was given as a Christmas gift, it stayed on the bar counter in the basement. At some point, did it move? Yes. Do you know where it went? It went to the gun safe. And is that the same gun safe that you previously mentioned? Yes. The one that your mom did not have access to? Yes. In the many years that you lived at home with your mother, did you ever observe her clean a firearm? No. Did you ever observe her 
load bullets into a magazine? No. Do you ever observe your mother fire a gun of any kind, hers or otherwise? A Nerf gun? How about one with real bullets? No. In your home, Brooke, was there a particular place that medicines were kept? Yes. Where was that? Uh, so in the kitchen, there's the kitchen sink, and to the upper left is where all the medica medications were kept. Um, was that a locked or an unlocked cabinet? Unlocked. And were the medications in there kept current? Oh, no. Can you describe what you mean by that? I believe when I moved out, there was amoxicillin of mine from 10 years prior. So just whatever anyone had that they didn't finish up or they, you know, instead of going and turning it in or flushing it down the toilet or whatnot, they just threw that medicine in the cabinet. Downstairs in the lower level, the area that you said Dan would hang out in, um, was there a source of heat down there? Yes, a wood stove. Can you talk about that wood stove and how it worked in your house? So the wood stove was the only source of heating we used, typically. Um, it was what we used to heat the entire house. So typically, there was a, you kept the tea kettle of water on top of it. And um, sometimes it'd get fairly hot down there so you could heat the entire house. Was it common for your family to utilize the wood stove? Yes. Can you talk about that? That's all we use for heat. Um, was there a reason that the wood stove was the primary source of heat in your house? Because it like heating through the, like, the heating company is too expensive. And was that an opinion that was expressed by a particular person in the house? Very often, yes. And who was that? Dan. Um, would Dan say things to you or other members of your family about the cost of heating? Yes. What kinds of things would he say? Oh. We were poor and couldn't afford to heat our house that way, and we had to be frugal. The um, the wood stove would require restocking. Correct. Yes. And who was primarily was responsible for that? To restock the wood for the wood stove. Dan would chop the wood for the wood stove in the summer, um, but typically, you know, he was gone a lot of winter time. So my mom and I would take turns restocking the wood. And what was the point of the tea kettle on the stove? For at like an air humidifier. And was it common for your family to keep water or refill the kettle with water? Constantly. Constantly. I would get in trouble if I let it go out, essentially. From that downstairs room, um, could you hear things going on on the floor directly above? Yes. Can you talk about that? So, just a quick pause. Um, Honeybee said he could have actually or could he actually have been planning her death back then? I'm just trying to think because um, Brooke said it was about five years before Candy's death or Candy was murdered. Allegedly, that's what this case is all about, proving that. Um, so it was about five years before that Dan bought her this gun for Christmas. But it, what if it was six years or so before? You know why I say that? It's because in 2013 was when Dan was accusing Candy of having an affair with one of his best friends, something like that. And then he was shooting a firearm at the friend's house, pouring syrup in his car, and sending him threatening messages. Now, imagine if it was around that time that he bought Kendi this gun. You know? You just don't know how much, how long was this darkness in Dan Howard? How long was he thinking about this? You know what I mean? Just wonder. Um, okay, so now we're going to hear, of course, about the, the acoustics of the house. Because remember, Dan Howard says he thought he heard a thump, you know, or a thud is what he said, like something hitting the floor. Didn't think it was a gunshot. Like, in a house where so many people have described already that it's like, <laughs> you can hear just about everything, you know? So that's interesting as well. So let's hear. So it's directly above. We always had to have all the vents open because that's how the heat from the basement went up to every other room. So everything's right above you. You could hear doors opening, doors closing, people walking. You could hear heated or, you know, like raised voices if someone was up there in a louder noise. And... Um, was there a lot of insulation between the two floors that kind of muffled sounds? I wouldn't say so. 
during the time that you lived there as an adult, um, did you become close with your mother? Yes. Was it a development of a relationship beyond just being a kid? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? My mom is my best friend. She was my daughter's best friend. I couldn't ask for a better role model or just a better person to be around. And I didn't even have to like find her and choose her. She was just there. I was lucky enough to just have her there. Where do you work from? Kootenai Health. Where did your mom work? Kootenai Health. So you see your mom every single day? Um. Every work day, the only uh, exception would be Fridays, because she did not work Friday, so Monday through Thursday. And when you were living there, would you see her every day? Yes. <laughs> was your mom an affectionate grandma towards your daughter? Very. What ways? Uh, she would watch her, no questions asked. They went shopping together. They went and did their nails together. They would go on hikes together. They were just... Um, my mom made every effort to be involved in my daughter's life to the fullest of her capability. Did the relationship that your mom had with you and with your daughter continue even after the two of you moved out? Yes. Did you continue to talk to your mom nearly every day, even when you weren't living there? Yes. Even when you didn't see her at work? Yes. Maybe a little too much sometimes? <laughs> Probably annoyingly so sometimes. When you were living there, did you ever go into the bathroom when your mom was taking a bath? I did. Um, did you ever have the opportunity to observe her while she was in the bath? Yes. When you had those opportunities to observe your mom in the bath, did you ever notice her to take her purse into the bathroom with her? I wouldn't say it was common, but it did happen. If she did take her purse into the bathroom, where would she put it? She would put it next to the bath um, so she could reach it. And, and did she take it into the bath for a particular reason? Yeah, sometimes she would need to pay bills or whatnot, and since she was in there, she, she felt like she had time to do that in there. Did she take anything else in there? She, she would take her phone if she was talking or you know texting someone, and um, her glasses so she could see. Where would your mom um, keep her purse if it wasn't uh, with her? Often she left it in the car. Sometimes she would keep it in the kitchen, on the kitchen counter. And would that car be in the garage? Yes. And would that car be unlocked? Yes. Question to the witness. Okay. Do you know your mom to like to take selfies? Yes. I'm going to show you what's already been entered into evidence as states 33A, B, C, and 34. Do you recognize these? What do you recognize these to be? This is my mom with her cat, Betty. There's Betty again, Betty again, and those are her legs in the bathtub. These appear to be accurate pictures. Yes. Of your mom, and I guess Betty to be? Yes. Person to publish. You bet. Let's start with 33A. So who's in that picture? It's the side of my mom's face, and there's Betty. What do we see in the background there? In the background, there's a scale on the floor, and in the uh, upper, there's a black towel and a pink towel. Based on anything in this picture, are you able to tell which bathroom this is? Yes, this is her bathroom. Do you recognize the towels in that picture? I do. Um, anything particular about them? Uh, they were the towels that matched the bathroom, so you shouldn't use those on a daily basis, and you were instructed not to touch them. <laughs> so when your mom used that bathroom for her, excuse me, for her nightly bath, did she use those pink and black towels to dry off? No. Who's in that picture? There's Betty. Anybody else? My mom's arm in the side. What's behind Betty? It looks like a shampoo bottle. 
Were those um, bottles always in that bathroom? Yes. And was that were those the shampoo bottles that your mom would use to wash her hair in the mornings? Yes. And were those facing in to the bath? In this picture? Yes. Betty again. I don't know. I'm trying to lighten this up a little bit so that you can see it. So, is that your mom in the bath? Yes. And if you can step out if you need to see, I know that there's a little bit of glare going on. Um, it appears that this particular photo, um, she's in water. Yes. Would you agree with that? Okay. Are you able to see where the water line is on that picture? Yeah. Would that be typical for your mom to fill the bath up that much? Yeah, that looks right. <coughs> and there's your mom's legs? Yes. And is that about how she would like to stretch out in the bathtub? Yes. <coughs> Did you and your mom ever communicate through text? Yes. Is your mom easy to communicate with through text? If you learned how to understand her, yeah. Describe what you mean by that. So she just did a lot of typos and she did not care to fix them. It was the receiver's job to figure out what she had said. Did your mom text a lot? Oh yeah. Which is the same that uh, Daniel Prado said, you know, and he also said it was such a smile, with such warmth of like, yep, you have to figure out what exactly it is she's trying to say. She just types and off it goes. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much. I really appreciate your sticker. Pernille said Kendi needed to go back to the house for sweet Betty. True. She did say she's got animals there to go back to, to look after. Shame. My word. We've got about an hour left of trial footage for this day. Was the, were the typos in her text messages the result of dyslexia or a learning issue? Not at all. Uh, Jamal wore glasses. You mentioned your mom wore glasses. Sometimes. Yes. Um, was that the reason for the typos? I don't believe so. Did she wear glasses all the time? Not all the time. If she was reading or something like that, yes. Reporting through some of this. Woody Decent. I, th I think this is a slam dunk case, but I agree it may or may not, but the state is defiantly scoring more points. Yes. That's right, Simi. They both smiled about that. Okay, let's just see what's going on here. Okay. So you and your mom were close. Yes. How about you and Dan? I wouldn't say close. Growing up, um, you and Dan butt heads. Often. Did Dan White get along? Way more than we did, yes. In your many years of living with Dan and Kendi, both as a child and as an adult, did you have opportunities to view Dan interact with your mother? Yes. Would that be um, both out in public as well as in the privacy of your home? Yes. Was there a difference in the way that Dan treated your mother in public and how he treated her in the privacy of your home? 100%. How did Dan treat mm, 100% different. So out, out there, he'd be putting on his act, you know, being a nice guy. By the way, this is uh, the picture that Brooke shared of her mom in that post that I read to you a little bit earlier when she posted about, you know, being her mom's advocate and being at the trial every day and she wasn't too sure who's going to stream it and who's not. So I hope that she can see this and that she knows there's a whole community here supporting her, you know, as she uh, bravely takes the stand in this case and fights for justice for her mother. Treat Kendi out in public. Lovingly. 
In what ways? He would hold on to her. He would kind of like kiss her on the cheek or whatnot. He would be helpful to, you know, go grab her a drink or something like that. What about at home? It was different at home. Did you ever hear Dan speak to your mom in a way that wasn't kind? Yes, often. What kind? It's like narcolert, right? <laughs> you know, he sounds like a bit of a narcissist there, huh? Just that's an understatement. Just like out there, he's so helpful. You know, let me get you a drink. Can I get you something? Kissing her on the cheek, loving for the what public audience. But then at home, ooh, totally different. The things that you hear Dan say. He would call her fat, a whore, stupid, uh, dumb Indian, a slut, a bitch. Were these things that you heard once or more than once? More than once. Were these things that you heard as a child or as an adult? Both. Well, permission to snark it up about Daniel Howard, <laughs> right? All the things he said. Oh, so we can call him things. <laughs> Were these things that you heard with greater frequency closer to her death? Yes. In your many years living with Dan and Kendi, did you have observations to observe Dan speak to Kendi about money? Yes, often. Can you describe that? It was never a pleasant conversation. He was always frustrated with the amount of money she was spending, what she was spending money on. Did you ever hear Dan talk about his own money? Yes. What did that, what, what would he say? All of the money Dan had brought into the house was strictly his money. And then her money was deposited into the household, but that was still not her money. Damn, so he did a whole, what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine. <laughs> Everything is all mine. Wow. Did you ever hear Dan say things to you or to your mom about purchases for the household? What do you mean? What, sort of little things like groceries or things like that. Yeah. So my mom was responsible to buy all the groceries out of like the joint account that her paycheck fed to in as well. Yes. And would Dan be happy about how she managed that? Never. What about big things like campers, motorcycles? That was used with Dan's money, so that was that was not a fight. And then if they were used with Dan's money. Were they Dan's things? Yes. Do you ever know Dan to keep track of bank accounts or bills? He kept track of those type of things daily. What do you mean by that? He would check the bank accounts daily and if there was charges he did not approve of, he would reach out to my mom or myself. Did you... Did you ever hear um, Dan say specific things about your mom's weight? Often. What would he say? He would often come up behind her and grab her sides and tell her to stop eating so much, uh, tell her that she needs to go work out more often, um, tell, call her a fat ass, and say he would have a workout regimen that could make her finally look good. Did you know your- Damn, that snark tank is filling right up, huh? Wow. Ah, oh, this guy, like what a complete asshole. I don't know how else to say it. Like this guy. Oh no. The worst shame. And then she was all self-conscious and everything about her weight. Well, no wonder. He's busy saying all these things to her all the time, breaking her down. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for being a member for 14 months. Oh my goodness. Forensic Fuhrer says control freak. CJ says, exactly. Wow, and someone said there earlier, who was it? Who was it? Dan Dan, the spineless man. Mm-hmm. An insecure coward. Your mom to do anything about the comments that Dan made? My mom was constantly trying to lose weight. What kinds of things did she do to lose weight? My mom would take weight loss pills. My mom would go to the gym. She would wake up four in the morning to go to the gym. She, um, you know, would often be on diets. 
Did there come a point in time um, where your mom shared with you an intent to do something a little bit more drastic than that? There's been, for a long time, my mom has wanted um, plastic surgery, yes. Well, anything specific? She was very self-conscious about um, her stomach from her C-sections and wanted a tummy tuck, and she did not like how her breasts appeared either. Did she ever, um, in 2020 or 2021, tell you that she'd taken any steps towards doing that? Yes. What did she do? She had reached out for a consultation with Dr. Owsley's office. Was that for a specific procedure? Yes, that would have been for the tummy tuck and the breast augmentation. Did you ever hear Dan say anything to your mother about her mental health? He called her crazy and that she needed to get on medication all the time. Now, in 20, late, let's say, summer forward of 2020, through your mom's death, you were not living at that house, is that correct? Correct. Were you still corresponding with your mother at the frequency that you previously described? Yes. And you would see her in person how many days a week? At a minimum, four days a week. You and your mother, did you work in the same department at Kootenai? We didn't work in the same department, but our departments interacted with each other. And so, at work, you would have opportunities to cross paths with her? Yes. Would she seek you out at work? Yes. Um, during that period of time, did your mother share with you any future intentions? Yes. What kinds of things was she telling you about her future intentions? Her intentions were to get divorced. Um, she was going to get moved forward with the plastic surgery. She was looking forward to buying a house. She had purchased a hot tub. Um, she had begun seeing someone. She told you that? Yes, she did. When did your mother tell you that she had begun seeing someone? It was either late December or early January, a few months. A couple, honestly, it was at least two months, so I guess that'd be December. Did she tell you who it was? Yes. Who was it? Daniel Prado. Did she tell you whether or not she had an intent to form a future with him? Yes, she did. What did she say? She said that he was helping her buy the house. Um, she said they had discussed if they'd move in together. There, she didn't tell me if there had been a decision regarding that yet. That he had offered her to work for him, but she was not planning to do so. Um, she invited me to go on a trip with them, me and my daughter. It was to this concert, it was a country concert, so I don't really remember. <laughs> did you tell Dan? I did not. When you and your mom would text, um, did you communicate through like the normal text feature or did you use an application? We used text and uh, mess Facebook Messenger. Okay. Wish you approach the witness. So um, my second smile said, so sad that Candy didn't escape in time. But as you always say, G, we can learn from this tragedy. Anyone who's dealing with stuff like this, you don't have to put up with it. Get to safety fast. I agree. You know, because I think in situations like that, you feel so alone. So to be like, well, this is actually a pattern, you know, of DV abusers, narcissists, abusers in a relationship. And no one deserves that, you know. And it can really end badly. I mean, they could be completely unhinged and could murder you, right? So yes, get to safety fast and you absolutely deserve the best life for yourself. You know, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Horrible. This with 42 A and B. You ready? Actually, just A. Okay. I'm handing you some marked states 42A. Do you recognize this? Yes. What do you recognize this to be? This is the hot tub that she bought at the fairgrounds. Is this a conversation between you and your mother? Yes. Does that appear to be accurate portion of a conversation that you had with your mother? Yes. Okay. To admit 42A. Okay. Publish. Okay.
And Judge Walt, the jury's looking at that. May I approach Madam Clerk? You may. Thank you. That's so true, Savannah says. I will say, her story inspires me to really take steps to make a happy life plan for myself. She was doing it. Yes, that's... She was doing it. She was so close to being free and starting a new life and having a house and a hot tub and a guy that truly loved her. I mean, it's just so sad that Dan Dan, the spineless man, got in the way. too far. Okay. You may continue. Not at all. I am going to uh, publish 71B, which has already been admitted to evidence, and then I'm going to also show you 36A, B, C, and D, which have also already been admitted. If you need to step out into the well to see, you're, you're more than welcome. Okay. 71. That is my mom's handwriting, Kendi's. How do you know? Very loopy and kind of messy. 36A. That is Dan's handwriting. 36B. Dan's handwriting. 36C. Dan's handwriting. 36D. Dan's handwriting. Some of this, uh, Folding, underlining, is that also something that was common to see in dance writing? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to turn your attention to late January of 2021. Okay. You previously testified that your mom did not work on Fridays? Correct. At some point, did you become aware of an incident that occurred on Thursday, January 29th? Maybe it was Fri Friday, January 29th? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, you did not see her that day, is that correct? Correct. When would have been the next time that you saw her? The following Monday. When you saw your mother that following Monday, what was her demeanor? Don't tell me what she said. What's her demeanor? Stressed. Scared. On that Monday, January 29th, 
Did you discuss with your mother any future plans that she held on that day? Sorry, you, you just said on that Monday, January 29th. I'm sorry. On that Monday after January 29th, did you discuss with your mother any plans that she held on that day? Yes. What plans did she have in her mind on that day? After work, she's going to go get her nails done. Did she have any long-term plans that she talked with you about that day? Yes, she also needed, after the nail appointment, she needed to get home and start cleaning her house as the realtors were going to be there to look at it. I can't remember if that they were coming Tuesday or Wednesday. Oh my word, she was so close to getting out, getting that freedom. You know, and she was making long-term plans. She had bought a property. She was buying a hot tub, you know. Which, I mean, she loved to take baths, so I'm sure, yeah, buying the hot tub and she was going for a tummy tuck and breast augmentation and, you know, this new relationship that she had. Shame, man. She would have, she was looking forward to a new life is definitely what it sounds like from multiple witnesses now. That, wow, blows the defense strategy right out of the water like as if, <laughs> as if one would go get your nails done and make all these plans and book realtors and everything, and then take your own life. Like, yeah, right. Did um, your mom tell you whether or not she was planning to divorce Dan? Yes. Did she, your mother ever tell you or not whether she was going to utilize an attorney to assist her in that process? Yes. On that Monday that you saw her at work, did she express to you her continued intent to divorce Dan? Yes. Do you recall what time of day-ish you interacted with your mom on that day? Noon, one inch right there. It was for like her lunch hour. At the time that you saw her, um, was she suffering from any major injuries? Not that I could see. Brooke, did there come to be a time where you found out that your mother was dead? Yes. How did you find out that your mother was dead? Dan got a hold of me. Did he call you on the phone? Yes. Do you recall approximately what time and what day Dan called you? February, February 3rd, 6.30ish. And that 6.30 a.m.? Yes. Where were you when you got this call? I was in my car, uh, ready to go to work. When you saw Dan calling on your phone, was that unusual or not? Very unusual. When you answered, what did you hear Dan say? I believe he said that something had happened or there had been an accident, something along those lines. Was it a lengthy conversation? It was short. Why? I hung up. Why? He, after he said that happened, he then said she shot herself something along the lines of she shot herself. I hung up to call 911. Did you have a second opportunity to speak to Dan? Yes. How did that occur? I can't remember if he called me or I called him. One of us called each other probably roughly an hour to two hours later. I think it had been some time. When... You reconnected. What did Dan say? He maintained that she shot herself. Brooke, when you reconnected with Dan, what was your emotional state at that point in time? Probably not good. I was probably a little hysterical. Were you crying? Yes. Were your emotions racing? Yes. Were you excited? in the sense of your, your feelings, you were elevated? Yes. Um, was your voice raised? Yes. When you called Dan back, what did you say? Um, I, I'm sorry, you, you, that was not what you testified to. When you reconnected with Dan, what did you say? I asked him what did he do, and I told him I know that she wouldn't do that. She would not have shot herself. Um, I, he kind of mumbled around a bit. I believe I got to the point of asking if he was in custody and if the cops were there. Did you yell at him? Yes. During this period of time, were you also in, con in connection with Kumi? 
the her employer off and on yes at some point um, did you um, I did not did you have a later option to speak with Dan in person I have not you spoken with Dan in person since then I have not is there a point in time that you were involved in making arrangements um, for a funeral and things of that nature? Yes. Was there a point in time where you were present for a phone conversation where Dan was on speakerphone? At the funeral home, yes. Were there other people present as well? Yes. What was the, the purpose of that call with Dan? The funeral home director was trying to get a hold of him so he could finalize what he had to do. And during that call, did Dan make any statements? He did. What did he say? Um, he said that he would pay for how we wanted her to be either cremated or buried. He would pay for that. But that was all he would be doing. Did you attend the funeral? I did. Did a lot of people attend the funeral? They did. Did Dan attend the funeral? He did not. I don't think I have any other questions for you, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Before we turn the cross examination, it's time for an afternoon break. Um, so we'll oh, a little mid afternoon break. We're going to teleport right through. So Savannah Churchwell is sharing some um, statements from Kendi's obituary. If you want to read the whole thing, uh, we did go through that on day one of the trial. So in the beginning, right before we started the, the actual trial day, if you watch day one, then I read the whole thing to you if you are interested. Um, I think I linked it in the description box as well. So, okay, now we've got just over half an hour left of today's trial day. All right, so sure. Look at him. Very hectic how she really just about would be like facing him sitting there the way this courtroom is right sure I just want to address the gallery briefly I, everyone has been so far very well behaved and I've appreciated it. There's been no emotional outbursts or anything like that. And so uh, I want to keep it that way when the attorneys brought it to my attention there. There was a few times where there was some laughter and so forth. It, it wasn't over the top or inappropriate, but I just want to remind everyone to make sure that you don't respond to testimony that you hear from the state. So I, I'm just I'm not lecturing anybody. Everyone's doing pretty well, but I just want to put that as a reminder. Okay, we'll be in recess for about 10 minutes. Here we go. And right then we teleported. The sound should come back on now. Where's the sound? We should do it often? Yes. Um, you talked about a bath. Uh, when she would do her bath, would she often have the... I don't know why the sound, you know, sometimes when they come back from recess, it takes a little while <laughs> for the camera person to get the sound going again. So I don't want to miss it. Sounds like cross examination, yes. So let's just go like a little bit forward ish, like here. Okay. I'll update this quickly while we wait. And would your mom tend to be, uh, spend more money and say, damn? Obviously. Okay. You said they had motorcycle. Uh, there's a motorcycle. They would go on motorcycle rides together, right? Yes. They would. You said they had a camper. They would take camping trips together. Yes. Now, you described her on Monday wanting to get her nails done. Yes. Is that something she liked to do? Yes. Does she do it often? Yes. 
Um, you talked about a bath. Uh, when you do a bath, would she often have the stereo on? I wouldn't say often. But she would? Rarely. But she liked to put bubbles in the bath? Yes. Uh, that was her uh, That was her place to relax? Yes. I have no problem. Can you read her? I hope she sees this. I hope she knows lots of grizzlies have got her back and she did so well. My goodness, she was strong, right? Wow. And Pernille said there was a warm laugh from the gallery when Brooke talked about her mom's fun ways. Yes. So I think there's two more witnesses for this day. Matt Kulak. Good afternoon, sir. Can you come forward, please? If you would face my clerk, raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you, sir. Do you have a seat there? As best you can, speak into the microphone. Thank you. Check. You may the court. Please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Matthew James Kulak, K-U-L-A-C. Are you employed? Yes. How, how are you employed? Oh, I'm employed at Kootenai Medical. Do you work in a particular department? Yes, I'm in Central Services at Kootenai. And that is where Kendi worked as well. She also worked at this uh, Kootenai Health. So you could see there was a picture that I had up earlier of her in her work uniform. I'll quickly find it for you, this one which you can see is the same logo that he has, that she's wearing there. Okay. And what is central services? It's uh, the supply part of the hospital. What kind of supplies do you deal with? Uh, we deal with everything that the nurses and doctors need to do from surgeries to putting a bandaid on a person. So would that be things like gloves, things like surgical utensils, things like that? Um, we, we do have a few of those things, yes. Do you also deal with medications? Not much, no. Do you deal with chemicals? A little bit, yes. Do, how long have you worked there? Uh, about 14 years now. During your time working in the services department at Kootenai, did you come to know an individual by the name of Kendi Howard? Yes. How long did you and Kendi, did you work together? Yes, we did. How long did you work together? About 13 years. In your 13 years working together, was that together in that same department? Yes, it was. Did you work similar shifts? Pretty close to the same shifts, yes. And so did you see Kendi most days that you went to work? Most days I went to work, yes, I saw her. For 13 years? Pretty close to that, yes. <laughs> Can you kind of describe a little bit about what your, your job involves on a day-to-day -day level? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, when we first, as receivers, when we first get to uh, work, we have a big uh, shipment done. It's called from Medline. That's our main supplier for the hospital, and uh, so they will bring anywhere between you know five to ten pallets of, of uh, product a day, and it gets staged in different areas. And as receivers, um, there's normally four to five of us and we break down to so like this the part that goes into the um, central services to be broke down into like pieces. We start on that first. So, and that tales of like one person will grab the paperwork for that order and the other three people will start um, calling out like line, item five and there's six of these box, these cases of them. And as we break them down and set them off to the side, um, we just we do that until all items are counted for and then once they're accounted for and we verified that then we start We grab carts and we start uh, breaking those pieces out of, the, out of the cases and put them on the shelf as each is Would the same person do the same job every day or would you guys kind of mix it up? 
Um, we pretty much do the same job every day. If somebody's missing, you wouldn't be on the bigger order. You'd be on the other side of the wall doing like the um, CSMOR orders, you know, which is the main OR. You know, it's the same concept, just different parts of it. Is there a particular part of that that Kendi likes to do? She was always on the CS side doing the breaking up those big pallets and putting it away on the, in the cleaner rooms. Now, would you be the ones that would be unloading that pallet off the truck? Most of the time, no. Medline will bring them and stage them for us inside the building. They're normally there before we get there. So you're just taking them off the pallets and putting them on the shelves? Yeah, we're taking it off, taking individually boxes off the pallet, putting them on the, you know, once they're lined up on one side because we counted them and we verified them, and then we take them off and take the pieces out and put them on the shelf. Sounds like kind of a physical job. It is. It common to get bruises at your job? You get a couple here and there. So you pick up a box wrong and it turns on you, you know, that kind of thing. But Is it a dangerous job? No. Is it a job that has safety procedures in place? Yes. I mean, we all have, you know, we go through back training when you get there, you know, and, and, and you, you know, just kind of make sure you just lift with your knees and you know, out your back, that kind of stuff. So, If someone were to get injured on the job, are there policies in place for Kubi? Yes, we have a, a, a program through uh, employee health, it's called the MINUS program. So if you happen to fall on the ice or you know, pick up a box wrong and you twist your back or something like that, cut yourself, um, you could go to the computer or you can go to your supervisors and tell them what happened and they would it gets rolled up in the computer so that way it's verified that what happened and then they figure out from there what the next step is for you if there was say a, a major injury on the job um, would you be allowed to just walk it off or would you be required to report it to a supervisor um that is so when you, you're supposed to report it to your supervisor so they can determine if you need to see go to to the uh, emergency room now, or we can hold off for a day or two to sit, you know, that kind of thing. Um, was there ever a point in time, let me lay back a little bit. So you and Kendi worked together for 13 years. About 13 years, yes. Were you friends? Yes. What was Kendi's demeanor like on a typical work day? Well, she was, Pretty high spirited. You know, Kendi didn't have too many secrets when it comes time. She liked you. She liked you. If you didn't, you, you got her match. You knew it. So. Was Kendi chatty. Yes, she was very chatty, especially with you know with the girls, more the girls than the guys. But I was always considered part of the girls, as she would always say. <laughs> Over the course of your years together, did Kendi uh, share things with you about her life? A few things, yes. Was Kenny uh, a, a person that you frequently socialized with outside of work, though? Yeah, we'd text every now and then, um, you know, show you know, pictures like if she went fishing, she'd catch a fish, hey, look what I caught, you know, kind of things like that, yeah. But you weren't, like, regularly going to her home or anything like that? No. In July of 2020, did Kenny Howard show you a photograph that um, caught your attention? Yes.
Mr. Kulak, what was it about that photograph that Kimmy showed you in July of 2020 that stood out to you? Um, it was a good sized bruise on her on, on her. You side. saw where? It was kind of up in her chest area on the side. Was this a bruise that you saw on her person or just a picture of it? I saw it on a picture of it. And she, she so that was from the domestic battery charge that he's now facing. Mm -hmm. July of 2020. Show that to you on her phone? Yes. Commission approached the witness with what has already been entered into evidence as 29. You yeah. have? Showing you what's already in evidence as states 29. Do you recognize this? Yep, that's the picture she showed me off her phone. Commission to publish? Yeah. Uh, it's definitely Kendi. And do you recognize what she's wearing? She's wearing our Kootenai Central Service work shirt, yes. When she showed you this photo, did she indicate to you whether this was an injury that she sustained on the job? Yes, it did not happen at, at work. After July of 2020, and the time before her death, Kendi Howard ever talk to you about plans for the future? Yes. What kinds of things did she share with you? Um, she was going to move to Kamii, go back home and take a little time off, and then she was she had a job kind of lined up, and she was buying a house, and she was just going to start all over that over at home. When Kendi would talk to you about these future plans, what was her demeanor? And those future plans were already from seven months before. July. After that, I think that was it for Kendi. You know, after that domestic battery, all that bruising on her chest and her ear that they said on the indictment was all like reddened and stuff. She was like, yeah, no, I'm done. So it was a few months that she would have planned to like look for a house, to make an offer on the house, to buy the house, to get the hot tub, to decide on um, a tummy tuck and breast augmentation and, you know, start talking to the boyfriend that she had. That she had known from high school. Wow. She's very happy about it. She was excited to go. Did you work with Kendi Howard on February 2nd of 2021? Yes. Do you recall what your shift was then? I believe I was on a 10 hour shift that time. What time did you start in the morning? To I return? started at 4 30 and ended at 3. Is that the same shift that Kendi had? Hers was hers. She had a ten-hour shift, but it started a little later than me. Like half an hour. An so. hour, I think. Yeah. So, would it be fair to say that you and Kendi worked together for the majority of your shift? Yes. So she would have. You would have gotten off a little earlier than her. Right. Okay. On February second, twenty-one, did you observe a major injury on Kendi? No. Did you hear, um, or were you called into any meetings about someone sustaining a major injury? No. Did you observe um, any accidents on the job? No. Were you working with any chemicals on that day? Not that I can think of. Were you working with any hot liquids on that day? No. Is it typical for you to work with hot liquids? No. Who's your approach? Yeah. I'm going to show you what's already in evidence as states 18F. Did you observe Kendi Howard have anything like this on February 2nd at work with you that day? No. Commission to publish? State are such good witnesses, right? Oh my goodness. Just one after the other after the other. Really, really proving their case. We sometimes, you know, when we watch trials together, we're like, ah, are they proving their case? You know, I was a little worried in Adam Montgomery's trial. 
Thankfully, he was found guilty, guilty. But this one, they're really doing a good job. You worked with Kenny Howard on February 2nd. You did not observe her to have this injury to her arm. No, I did not. Would an injury like that have resulted in a meeting with the supervisor? Yes. Probably meeting with the whole staff? Yeah, we would have been told something, yeah. I don't have any other questions for you, but Mr. Johnson will. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have no question. Thank you, sir. You missed it. Not one question. Interesting. Caroline, thank you for what you emailed me. I just can't see what you see. I can't see the things that you're saying. I could see that he says, we talk about Jason Johnson, the defense attorney, 11 years of experience, criminal law, personal injury, DUI and DWI. I could see that. But I can only see one review and nothing else. So whatever it is that you're reading and telling us about in chat, please send it to me. I want to see. <laughs> okay, so now, is this the final witness for the day? I just want to see my scribbles quickly. It might, it might be Paul Berger. Witness number 27. Okay. Thank you. You made a court. Thank you, Judge. Can you say your whole name and spell your last? Paul Berger. B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E How are you employed? I'm a captain with the Idaho State Police. Will you walk us through your law enforcement career, please? Yes. So in the summer of 1990, I went to work for the Shoshone County Sheriff's Office, where I worked for about four years until 1994, at which time I went to the Idaho State Police and have been there since. Can you tell us um, your various positions within the Idaho State Police? Within the Idaho State Police, I started as a trooper, and then I promoted into detectives. From detectives, I went to detective sergeant and detective lieutenant, and finally the district commander here in Quarterly. So as a district commander or captain, what are your duties? Uh, my duties are to make sure that the district one office here in Quarterly runs smoothly. I am in control of uh, both investigations and the patrol and make sure that those duties that are performed by those those agents are those persons in law enforcement are being done properly and taking care of day-to-day -day exercises that come in. What kind of area does District 1 encompass? District 1 goes from the Canadian border all the way to the Wayta County border. Um, we have five the five northern counties, Boundary, Bonner, Kootenai, Shoshone, and Benoit County. And are you the person responsible for all of ISP employees within District 1? I am. About how many ISP employees are you supervising within District 1? Supervising probably around 80. There's probably 97 people in the building. We also house forensics, which I do not run, and we have dispatch also. Okay. Can you describe for us how a trooper becomes a trooper in terms of post? Sure. So when I was a Shoshone County deputy, I went to the Idaho Post Academy, which at that time was seven weeks. The academy there, you would learn the basic operations of being a police officer, including arrest techniques, crime scenes, interview, um, physical fitness, crash investigations, and anything that pertains to the basics of law enforcement in general. And then after that, when I became a Idaho State Police Trooper, I had to attend a 14-week ISP Academy, which was also including several things of course, that, that work in those specific areas. Idaho State Police really concentrates on crash investigations, but in those crash investigations you learn how to do crime scene investigations, you learn how to do report writing, you have arrest techniques, you have physical fitness, arrest techniques and physical fitness are every other day during the 14 weeks. They um, also include accident investigations, and other basic law enforcement jobs that are going to be necessary as a Idaho State Trooper. As a trooper then going through post, do you learn the basics of DNA and how DNA is left and how you can collect DNA? You do, yes. Um, specifically, I, I, I go back to like a crash investigation, and in a crash investigation, you would be trying to determine who the driver of a vehicle was. If you had multiple people in the vehicle and there was dead, one person that died in the fatality, you would go back in and try to collect evidence, DNA evidence, evidence of who was sitting in the seat of the driver's seat. So in some cases, I've 
I've actually pulled teeth out of the out of the steering wheel, which is for the DEA or DNA purposes, as well as identifying who was driving it, as well as hair and blood and other things that might be in the vehicle to determine who actually is driving it. And as a detective, I've been to numerous trainings. What about fingerprints? Does an ISP trooper get trained in the basics of what can leave a latent print and what can't? Um, I would say yes, especially in my case, I had I had skills before that, but I mean we understand where fingerprints can be, you know, lifted off of, and certain areas are really hard to lift fingerprints. So you realize you look for the areas that are actually easier to pull a print to maybe see who was touching that object, like the knobs or anything that per, that would actually have a smooth surface where you can lift a fingerprint from. <laughs> He's got a lot of experience. He's seen a lot of things. And he's a little desensitized. We're all like, whoa. <laughs> We're listening to all of this. Damn. Okay. okay. Are troopers taught how to shoot their firearms? Yes. Extensively? Yes. Okay. And once you become a trooper, how does one become a firearms instructor? Uh, I was a firearms instructor. And to become a firearms instructor, you had to take the basic firearms qualification, which was for pistols and shotguns at that time, and you have to score a higher level than the average person that would be shooting on the range. It was a 95, as, and you went through a week-long class, and you had to teach and do other things pertaining to firearms, and then also, every year, you have to also take that test and qualify with that 95% or higher to, be, to maintain your firearms instructor. Okay. What's SWAT? SWAT is Special Weapons and Tactics. Um, it's a specialized team within law enforcement that is used to deal with situations that are above what a normal law enforcement officer would be, like hostage situations, search warrants, um, anything that requires a higher level of training and, and expertise would be what SWAT would be. Is it considered a prestigious appointment within ISP to be on ISP SWAT? It is. When you're... Quick pause, quick pause. Southern Charmed says, I'm here, but this trial is triggering me. I feel super anxious, yet I'm watching to give honor to Candy. Please remember to look after yourself, okay? If it's too triggering or it's causing you anxiety, look after yourself. There's some cases that I can't cover, even though people are like, do it, do it, cover it. Why aren't you covering it? Some, some cases are too much for me in my own way. So please look after yourself and your mental health. We will always save you a seat. Just remember... We really appreciate, I really appreciate that you are here with us right now. But if anything, I'm just letting you know, if anyone feels like, oh no, you like you have to do that like tough love approach and just push through, I understand the sentiment. You know, in honor of Candy, I get it. And that's very sweet. But just look after yourself, okay? Okay. Being taught to be an ISP trooper, are you taught how to take someone into custody? Yes. Can you run through the basics of that for us? So... You have either a non-compliant person or a compliant person. Compliant people are those who will do what you tell them to do to get them into the handcuffs. Non-compliant persons have to be dealt with with more force. And for a non-compliant person, you would use techniques to either pin them up against the car or take them to the ground. Um, getting them on the ground makes it easier for you to control that person. So can, there's. Over the 14 weeks, like I said, every other day, we were going through arrest techniques, different types of arrest techniques, using the PR-24s, which are no longer around, as well as uh, other tools that we have at our disposal to try to get somebody into custody. But taking them to the ground or pinning them against the car were the main reasons. And so what would be the easiest way to take someone to the ground? Now, we're taught several techniques to take somebody to the ground, but. One of the techniques would be you would you would do knee strikes, you would do trips, you would do any type of thing that you could spin them to the ground. So sometimes it would work the techniques you were taught. Sometimes you would just have to be in a fight to get somebody to the ground. So it could take a lot of a lot of force to get somebody to the ground. Is the goal to get them on the ground on their stomach? It is. Why is that? Getting them on their stomach makes it a lot easier for us to get the handcuffs in behind their back. Um, if you have them on their back, you're still going to have to roll them over to get the handcuffs behind their back. So it's easier just to take somebody to the ground and be on top where their back is so you can get those, those arms 
peeled out from the underneath them or wherever to get the handcuffs back on the person. Now, do we think that Daniel Howard was a compliant or non-compliant kind of dude when he got arrested? Then again, we already know the answer, don't we? Because he turned himself in, so, okay. Are you taught as a trooper the dangers of positional asphyxia? Yes. Can you describe what that is? Um, one of the best ways to describe it is the George Floyd case. While there was drugs on board him, there was also um, issues with that that pertain to when you put somebody on the ground and you're actually putting force upon their back or on their neck or wherever, you're going to be pushing their body down into the ground, which doesn't allow them to get a full breath of air in. So we also used to do hobbling, which is where we would restrain somebody's legs and you would actually tie their legs to the handcuffs on the back and then they would be laying on their stomach in the back seats of the patrol car and they would actually get positional asphyxia because they couldn't, depending upon the size of the person or whatever, they couldn't get the air into their lungs to be able to breathe properly. So positional asphyxia basically is just the pressing of the chest where you can't get enough air into your lungs. So I take it then ISP troopers are taught the basics of asphyxia? Yeah. Oh man. We can't even hobble anymore. Let's see where this is going. Yeah, he used his training. Dan Howard. For bad things. Or you, the hobbles are actually now used where you tie their legs and you hang the, or you tie the rope to something else, you know, so it doesn't actually attach to their handcuffs or they're not going to be able to breathe. As a trooper on the road during the course of years of employment with ISP, does one become exposed to a lot of death? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Um, in 34 years of law enforcement, I couldn't even tell you how much death I've seen. I've seen death in, you know, homicide cases. I've seen death in fatality crashes. I've seen death, you know, from suicide. I've seen death in a variety of, of uh, ways. And so does one, so to speak, become accustomed to it if you do that sort of work long enough? You have to become accustomed to it or it'll drag you nuts. As an ISP trooper, do you become familiar with the sound of gunshots? Yes. Why? Throughout training, you're shooting your firearms at all times. You also, as a trainer, are involved in the actual training of other officers, so you have the firearms going off all the time. Situations I've been in, I've been in shootings, um, I've been in, I've observed suicides occur, and yeah, you, you're around gunshots, and plus I've been hunting my whole life, so been around gunshots my whole life and as a trooper you would be around those two. And so you would become um, as a trooper aware of gunshots that were fired in your vicinity? Oh yes. Okay. You know Dan Howard? I do. How do you know Dan Howard? Dan and I went to the academy together in 1994. So long, how long have you known him? Since the academy. In 1994? 1994. 1994. Is, is he here today? 95. Yes, he is. Please point him out, just grab your seat and tell us what he's wearing. He's sitting at the defendant's table. He's wearing a blue blazer with a white shirt and glasses. <laughs> like I does that long point, sitting right over there. Gerda says, did someone say that is most, it's mostly men on the jury? Yes, Pernil told us yesterday and she sent me a clip. Thank you so much, Pernil, where they did say that it's mostly a male jury. Yes, indeed. So when you went to the academy with Dan Howard, was that with a group of other men that were that were going to become troopers? We had seven men and one woman, yes. Okay. And how long was the academy again? It was 14 weeks. So were you around him pretty constantly for that 14 weeks? Yes. Okay. Did you get to know Dan Howard fairly well? Yes. After that, perhaps a period of time went by, did you eventually end up working up here with him? Yes, I did. How long did that go on for? I don't remember when Dan came to District 1. Um, I was here before he got there, and we worked with each other there. I was a detective when he came up as a trooper. All right. So are you familiar with his career? I am. Are you familiar with what he's done in ISP? I am. At some point, was Dan Howard a firearms instructor? He was. Do you know how long that went on for or not? I believe he started in Lewiston, so I'm not sure how long. He started as a firearms instructor before I did. So a firearms instructor cannot recognize the sound of a gunshot in his own house? No, no. He said it sounded like, you know, a thud. Didn't think it was a gunshot. Like, 
<laughs> Who's going to believe that? Okay. At some point in his career, did Dan Howard become a member of SWAT? He did. You know how long that went on for? I'm not exactly sure how long that was. Was that while he was up here? I believe he was still on SWAT when he was up here, yes. And when he was up here, was he a firearms instructor as well? He was. Knowing Dan Howard professionally, as long as you know him, can you describe for us how he displays emotion? He's pretty stoic. And can you describe for us how he reacts to stress? Mm, depending upon stress, he can be either stoic or he can, I've seen him get very upset. Have you ever seen him bark or howl at the moon, sir? <laughs> Probably like, really no. <laughs> Pretty stoic. Oh, until the body cams are rolling, then it's, oh, <laughs> my goodness. When he does display emotion, how is that displayed? In my experience, it was anger. And how quick can he show anger? It was pretty quick. Are you aware of whether or not Dan Howard is physically a strong person? He's very strong. Very fit. No further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Captain. Yes, sir. So, Captain, on the... You mentioned about anger a moment ago. Your relationship with Dan was professional, correct? Correct. You weren't friends? Not friends. So, there are times where an officer would show anger over many different causes, correct? There could be, yes. Now, you stated, or you mentioned a story of the pulling a tooth out of a car, correct? Yes. Uh, so, officers are trained in evidence collection of some sort, correct? That's correct. But they're not trained on how to scrub or transfer DNA, correct? Mm. In post? In post. I believe they have some basic knowledge of it. I haven't been to post for a long time. Okay. And being around firearms, uh, different firearms sound differently when they're fired, correct? That's correct. Okay. So a lot of it depends on the caliber, size of the gun. Situation, location, yeah. What else is going on, stereo or anything else? What's that? No further questions. Thank you. Okay. Yep. No further questions. Any redirect? That was such a weird... <laughs> I don't even know what he mumbled there. Jason Johnson. <laughs> what? What? Sorry. No, no further questions. Nothing. Didn't say it. <laughs> okay, then. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of the training that Mr. Johnson touched on, does that encompass rendering aid to people? Yes. Does that encompass rendering aid to people that have suffered from trauma? Yes. We didn't see him do that. In terms of training for ISP troopers, especially SWAT, are they trained in situations that include outdoors, outdoor firing of their weapons? Yes. As well as indoor firing of their weapons? Yes. So do ISP troopers that are on SWAT become accustomed to the sound of gunshots within an enclosed situation? Probably more so than a regular trooper would be, yes. And would recognize the sign of a gunshot with an enclosed structure? I would assume so, yes, based on the fact that they do training within houses and shoot houses and stuff like that. They should be around that quite often, yes. Right. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Judge, we uh, have the ability to put on some more of these uh, Dan Howard, Kenny Howard uh, texts. 
another big volume of, of them. Uh, but we are going quite a bit faster than we thought we were, and we anticipate ending sooner next week than we did before. And so with all that said, would the court be inclined to end today now? It's because of all the defluffing. <laughs> That's why it's going so much quicker. <laughs> or would the court like us to produce this evidence for the jury to read tonight? I have a strong preference. I'm sure you want to use our time that we've got as efficiently as possible. But if you think we're much ahead of schedule, we could we could break early. I, I don't know if the jury has a preference. We could give you some time to read a little bit more. Or we could break early. And trust me, for over an hour, all that happened was the cameras were rolling, the jury was reading through some stuff, and that was it. There was also an hour and a half earlier that I saved you from, where they were just, the cameras were rolling and they were just waiting for the next witness. It's kind of hard to know how to ask you. <laughs> I've just seen a lot of kind of, you know, with... We're here, Judge. I guess that's to do. <laughs> so let's use our time wisely while we're here. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, if you have the ability to put on some next evidence, this will be just simply kind of reading like you did earlier. So, yeah, maybe we won't read for a whole hour, but let's get some of this, get some of this done. Okay, so, um, Judge, we would publish the 73A. It's going to be one of four. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Uh, 73A, we're publishing, Judge, one of four. Okay. And we've handed out the first part. Okay. This will be published to the jury, and the jurors just take the time to read it. When you're done reading, maybe look up and we'll give you the next section. And you see that little jump cut? Yeah, we just skipped an hour of our time. Just like, whoa, let's not watch them. <laughs> this was the view. Just like this. For over an hour. With no sound, except a bit of paper flapping. Okay. Um, I think that was a productive use of our time, so we will uh, go a little recess for the day. Thank you, the jury, for your time and attention. Very well. Anything else before we adjourn for the day? Just to put the court and counsel on notice that we're aiming to rest perhaps Wednesday next week. Okay. So the idea being perhaps this case could be completed by the end of next week. Okay. It would probably for sure go into the, the following Monday, but I see it wrapping up Monday, Tuesday. Okay, no problem. But just so just so Mr. Johnson, you're ready to be in the case sooner than what I don't want is I don't want the state to rest and then you don't have your folks ready. Yeah. So appreciate the heads up on timing. Okay, anything else before we break? Okay. Okay, thank you all for being with us. And see you all And that's it. Trial, day four, complete. <laughs> Angela says that one and a half hours yesterday must have been when I went there and there was nothing happening. Yeah, it was unbelievable. There was a lot of fluff, okay? From seven hours 44 down to three hours 51. Shame. That day had a lot of fluff. I'm glad we didn't have to sit through it live, honestly. That, that was a productive use of our time. So thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I know that some of you have only started watching today, so make sure that this weekend you catch up on day one, two, and three. And obviously today was day four. Everything is time-stamped for you so you could see all the witnesses when it's cross-examination or direct examination and what their names are and what they do and all of that. Okay? So I'm going to give you some time to catch up. And then on Monday, what we're going to do is start with day five. Obviously, today, the court is streaming day five, right? We're going to start with that on Monday so that we continue with this format because I think it's working out great for this trial in this courtroom. So they are in anticipating resting their case, the state, on Wednesday. And then, as you heard Jason Johnson, the defense attorney, say, well, he doesn't expect it to wrap up by Friday. He's thinking more like Monday, Tuesday. So we can just keep doing this format for next week and then we'll catch up next weekend so we can be live there for verdict watch and all of that. You know what I mean? We'll... Be ready for all of that. So I think the trial is going really well so far. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate you being here. Remember to like and share if you haven't done that yet, or maybe you could just share it again. Use the hashtags that are in the description box. There's some suggestions there for you. If you know nothing about the case, just read the description box as well. We do have some other cases to catch up on as well this weekend. Uh, tomorrow is my birthday. So thank you to everyone who <laughs> has sent coffees and PayPal's and everything. I really, really appreciate it. Of course, I'm going to go on a tiny little outing and things like that. So I'll share some of those photos and things on Patreon. So if you're interested, Patreon is the place to be for behind the scenes type of content. Okay. 
And I will see you all again very soon, okay? I appreciate these trial days with you. I think the state is doing really well. Let me know in the comments below what you think and who was your favorite witness today. For me personally, it was Kendi's um, daughter. She was so strong. Thank you, Mallory. Really appreciate it. And I'll see you all again very soon. Okay, bye.